Yo, 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 you're listening to Skeleton Key, a podcast about opening up and seeing what we find. I'm your host, Peter Sawyer, and this is the very first episode. A couple things I want to address real quick. Uh, The subject matter, it's going to vary. Ultimately, I think it's the crazy-ass stories the guests will share that will make this interesting, but each week I want to give you something new. Horror, punk rock, animation, documentaries, tattoos, comedy, fuck if I know, it could be anything. Uh, So this will probably be all over the map, but being unpredictable makes things fun, right? Right now it feels a bit like an experiment because there's no rules, but I'm sure I will get the hang of it. My first guest was horror historian David DelVal, and it was awesome having him on. As you'll see, we covered a lot, everything from Tom Adkins to the bad seat on Broadway to the time Anton LaVey kicked David out of his house... Time flew by and we talked close to three hours. That's a long time for a podcast. So I had to edit it down and in the process realized there were some mistakes I needed to clean up. I imagine that's going to happen a lot, so I'll be addressing those before each episode goes live. Also, you may notice my voice isn't that loud. I'm an idiot. I was doing this with quick time off a laptop without mics, um, but lesson learned and I'm going to get some and this should sound better. So let's get to it, our mistakes. The film The Quiet Ones is from 2014, and it's about a paranormal experiment, not an exorcism. My memory is shit, but it's a good movie. Uh, This one's embarrassing. Lords of Chaos is about a black metal band, not a death metal band. There's a distinction. I mean, stylistically, black metal borrows from death metal, but I just wanted to clear that up. Summer Breeze, the cover song David mentions that is in I Still Know What You Did Last Summer isn't done by Marilyn Manson. It's typo negative, but I can see why he mixed up the two. Uh, We talk about Timmy Capello. How can you not? If you don't know who he is, he's the big, muscular, oil-down sax player in Lost Boys. David told me to check out the Tina Turner video for Only the Living. It's off the Beyond Thunderdome soundtrack, and what's remarkable is... Timmy Capello is playing the saxophone in it, like you'd expect, but he's dressed up exactly how he is in Lost Boys. Thunderdome came out a year before Lost Boys, so I'm led to believe that that's just how Capello rolled in the 80s. It's it's worth a look. Um, Mindhunter was the David Fincher series we were talking about. My cat Cleo has a cameo. She interrupts the podcast, so when you hear some sniffling, that's her. Poor thing has a chronic upper respiratory issue, so she's always stuffed up. Um, And I'm hoping one day an antibiotic will actually work for her. I said the lady in black, but I meant the woman in black. Which is not to be confused with the lady in white, which we also touched on. I know that's confusing, but at least the woman in red isn't part of the conversation. I hope I say his name right, but Willard Hewick? Hewick? Uh, and Gloria Katz were a married couple, and they indeed wrote Messiah of Evil. They also wrote Temple of Doom and Howard the Duck, but they also wrote American Graffiti, which is pretty wild. Uh, Lastly, the film The Apple takes place in 1994, not 1997. Okay, so that about covers it, but before diving in, I just want to mention that the next episode's guest will be Pat Jenkowitz. Not only can this dude run as fast as a dog on all fours, but he wrote a book on Jaws, he's written for Fangoria, he was in the California Love video, which is pretty insane to imagine. He crashed the set of Return of the Living Dead, and I'm really just scratching the surface. He's a journalist, a great talker, so this should be another really fun episode. Oh, and I have to give Brendan Bonner credit, he's my producer, and he's making this sound a lot more professional than it otherwise would. I've said my piece, so let's get to it and turn the skeleton key. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Skeleton Key, a podcast where we delve into the depths of the human condition and explore themes applicable to life. And I'm actually completely fucking with you. This podcast revolves around shit I find interesting and I hope you do too. By shit, I'm generally talking about things like horror movies, punk rock, dark humor, crazy ass stories, you know, all that stuff. Um, But each episode's a different conversation with someone who contributes to the culture of cool. Okay, that was pretty bad, but... Let's just say I'll be waxing poetic with some folks who do cool shit that you should pay attention to. Uh, I promise I'm not going to have anyone boring on here, so uh, yeah, they will have something fun to say. 
Um, and if my half assery hasn't clued you in yet, this is the first episode. I'm Peter Sawyer, and I'm your host, so let's begin. Um, so we're based out of Los Angeles, California, and before introducing my guests here, I want to touch on a couple of cool events that are happening around here. Um, the first one is something I went to a couple of weeks ago called Rated R, A Horror Speakeasy. Um, for a few years, I was actually kicking around the idea of opening a horror bar. It never happened. Um, so going to this event was great because I kind of got to see what one would be like. And I was kind of jealous because it was done really, really well. Um, it's They're going to be doing this again um, in June. So if you're interested in seeing something that is like a horror-themed bar um, with a lot of people that love horror movies in that community, I would check out www dot rated r dot com because you have to rsvp to get the secret location once it's announced um so that's a really fun thing to do um the other cool event that i went to this past week uh was called the i like scary movies experience and that is basically a horror themed uh instagram museum for lack of a better word where they have I guess their sets kind of inspired by things like Nightmare on Elm Street and Beetlejuice and Lost Boys. And there's also It and The Shining. Um, And it's really, really well done. I mean, there's, there's more to it than just getting your photo taken with, you know, cool backdrops. But since you can't exactly visit the sets from the movies these days, uh, this is kind of the next best thing. And so that is going on through June. So if you're in the Los Angeles area, I would say check out those things. So, on with the show. Um, Today, I am here with my friend David Dalval, who I met doing horror trivia. Um, We play on a team called (laughs) (laughs) Children of the Porn. Yes. We're not the best team um, at trivia, but we're we're also not the worst. Um, It's been my pleasure getting to know David over these past couple of years, as he's a very interesting individual. He has done commentary on a lot of movies. He was an agent. Um, I want to call you a Vincent Price understudy, but I know you don't (laughs) want to be pigeon-held as that. But um, yeah, this will be a fun conversation, and you you guys should get acquainted with him. So say hello, David. Well, hello, Peter. I'm really – I'm your first guest, so I'm really – I'm really – you know, honored to be on your, on your very first podcast. And I want to mention among things that are going on in Los Angeles – of course, this probably will air afterwards, but this weekend is Monster Palooza in Burbank, or I'm sorry, not in Burbank, in Pasadena, the Pasadena Convention Center. And Monster Palooza is like the largest monster horror convention in the country, I believe. It's even possibly bigger than Chiller, if I, although I don't know. I, I've been to Chiller and it's pretty awesome and big too. But I'm going to be there this weekend, hopefully on Saturday and Sunday with Dee Wallace. And I'll be sitting with her, helping her with her table. And possibly I'll be there on Friday as well. So if you're in the Los Angeles area and you want to come down to Pasadena, which is an amazing little city unto itself with lots of shops and museums, etc., cetera, et cetera, come on down and look for me. I will be more than happy to uh, chat with you about movies or whatever. It's going to be really crowded and Saturday is going to be the big day. So anyway, that's what I'm doing this weekend. But right now, I'm doing a podcast with Peter Sawyer. (laughs) Yes, David, and thank you for for joining me for this. I'm excited to have you. And yeah, Monster Blues is a lot of fun. I've been to a couple of them. And, you know, I'm from the East Coast. And so horror conventions there are cool, but this is like kind of one of the the big ass ones. Well, the Chiller Theater, uh, the Chiller Theater in New Jersey. And uh, uh, was it in Newark or not Newark? It's in... uh, it's right outside. You can see the skyline of New York City from where it is. I've forgotten what town in New Jersey it is. But it's pretty big. And uh, But it's also, it was in a convention center, then it's in a hotel. I think it's a combination of those. I don't mind. I really would love to go to some of the conventions in the Midwest. Because I firmly believe, although East Coast, West Coast, I think in the middle country, in the middle states, 
Hollywood's a little more glamorous than it is here. <laughs> I mean, one of the, I mean, no, it's pretty, everybody's pretty, uh, we're not all jaded about it, but do you find that Monster Palooza, everybody's like kind of meh about everything or is it pretty, I think it's still pretty exciting. It's, it's definitely exciting. It's fun to see which, which guests you get because, you know, I'm from the Washington DC area. And so it was really exciting the first time I went cause you yeah. don't have Hollywood in DC. Um, but then you start going to them and you, they kind of feel the same. But then when I went to Monster Palooza after moving out here, I was like, Jesus Christ, this is like – this is 10 times the size and scope of what I was used to back east. So when you're seeing – you know, the, the cool thing about it in Los Angeles is all these people live around there. So they can change up the lineup each year of who they're bringing in and right. all that. So that's pretty exciting to see because they do a pretty good job of that. Well, one of the things one can address with conventions and autograph shows is exactly what I just said, autograph shows. When I started doing the Beverly Garland autograph show like back in the late 80s, early 90s, $10 was what people charged. And maybe 10 bucks to get in or you got in for free. But this industry has morphed into what is a very expensive, lucrative kind of, uh, of business where you can literally, there are some of these actors that are living off their convention appearances. They do three or four or five shows a year and you know, they make, that's their income. And uh, I've watched autographs go from $10 to five hundred dollars, depending on who it is. If Elvira or Robert England go into full makeup, the autographs can be over a hundred. So you can walk into a show, pay a like an entrance fee of fifty, twenty dollars, and then it's very easy to drop two or three hundred dollars in in less than three hours. So, you know, it's like, I'm always amazed at, at how much money, how much disposable income there is when people want stuff. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, certainly. I mean, what's interesting, too, is when I was going to horror conventions, I'm sure way later than you, um, it was, I guess eBay had existed for a few years, but there wasn't the same market for horror movie t-shirts. Oh, no. So you go there, and I kind of got to see the evolution of that, like the very first run of Fright Rag shirts or, you know, whatever. But I loved it because I was like, oh, I can get this stuff I can't get anywhere else. And now that has blown up, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Well, let me tell you about the t-shirt thing. When I first started, the, the first three ladies I got into doing autographs, who'd never done them before, Candace Hillegloss from the uh, Carnival of Souls, Barbara Steele from Black Sunday, and Udo Kier from uh, Flesh for Frankenstein and Blood for Dracula of the War. I mean, Udo Kier being Udo, but I'm a few years ago, when I first did my video watchdog interview with Udo, he had just moved to the United States from, from Germany. And so it was, he was so in demand because I've always said he's like Peter Lorre. If Peter Lorre were alive, he'd be doing Udo Kira stuff. But in any case, I was always against t-shirts because they're expensive to make. You, could, you can't make them in more than two sizes, either large or extra large, you, it's rare to get a small, and I'm a little guy, so I'm always looking for small t-shirts. In fact, at one of the Monster Paloozas, when I found t-shirts that were small, I bought a bunch of them, because you can't find them. They're all so huge. Right. But aside from that, I just found that fans weren't really ready to buy t-shirts then. This was like in the 80s, but now, and 90s, uh, but now it's like a whole industry. And it's not just personality t-shirts, like a Linda Blair, or a, an Exorcist, or uh, Linnea Quigley or a workout thing or Brink Stevens or, you know, or, or even the Marvel, the Marvel, the, the comic book thing's a whole other world. But I mean, our t-shirts, t-shirts are really part of the, of the, uh, swag now, aren't they? As far as. Yeah. I mean, I, I think part of it is a lot of fans that flock to, you know, especially the horror genre, probably listen to heavy metal or punk rock and stuff like that where band shirts were the thing. And so that's kind of jumped the shark in a, in a huge way, I guess. But I mean, when you first started going to shows where there were celebrities, were you, how, what was your experience with seeing people that maybe didn't look particularly like they did or? It was kind of interesting. I, I don't really get starstruck by, I, I used to be in bands and I, I don't really get starstruck around musicians for the most part. But seeing all these 
faces from horror movies I grew up with was really like, holy shit, yeah, like, this isn't yeah. something I'm used to, especially when they're all in the same room. It's like there's Pinhead and there's, you know, the return <laughs> cast of Return of the Living Dead and all that stuff. But I found that uh, they were all kind of approachable. Sometimes it took a minute to be like, oh, wow, yeah, they're they're much older. You know, you if I rewatch a movie, I'm seeing that version of that person from years ago. And obviously there's a passage of time, so they're not going to look like that. Um, but it was it was cool. And, you know, I kept kept going back. Well, sometimes you get pleasantly surprised and the people are really nice. Right. And that's pretty true for the most part. But I do think that having worked at these tables as long as I have, you know, it's a long day. I mean, when you're, when Martine Beswick and I were doing like, we did like, was like a, was like a tour. We did like 12 shows in a year and we started in LA and we ended up at Chiller and then back. And, uh, it was always a diminishing income. You know, when we first started doing them, we were making like really good money and Martin was like, yeah, you know, we'd get all this money and, you know, we'd stack it up and everything. By the 12th show, it was diminished and it was like you were making instead of $2,500, you were making $500. And I remember, I remember one of the last shows she and I did where we'd done like 20 of them. We'd done way too many. We made enough. She said, you know what? I made so little at this. We're just going to go to the bar and have margaritas with it. <laughs> and that's how we ended. And it was kind of fun. I remember that fondly. But I do remember that there was a lesson to be learned in that, that you can't overexpose yourself. Yeah. Now if you do too many. Although I say that and I see somebody like Linda Blair is at every show and she seems to do well. I guess with her... And it, what I like about Linda is a lot of the money that she gets at these shows goes to charity. Yeah, she's big into animal rights. Absolutely. So I have no problem with that. And she's a nice lady. Um, I, I did notice that I think this year Christina Ricci was at one or two of them. And she's someone I would actually expect to be at that. So she probably, there's a huge demand to see her. And then she's probably not going to do this for another 10 years or something. So. Like Jamie Lee Curtis. That was a huge deal. But to coincide with the new Halloween. I did that Halloween show, which was just a whole convention for three days built around Halloween and they had all the surviving Halloween actors, including the ones from the Rob Zombie movies, which is why when I was doing the show and I saw Sybil Danning, I said, what are you doing here? Because I could not remember what Halloween Sybil Danning was in. Well, of course I didn't remember because she wasn't in any of the original. She was in the Rob Zombie one. So, but they had everybody. Right, yeah. You were telling me that Tom Atkins had a pretty ingenious idea. He made out like, like a big hooker. What he did on Sunday, he said, okay, guys, when the show wraps on Sunday, if you want to spend a couple of hours with me in the bar that we shot Halloween 3 in, for $50, you can come and have beers with Tom Atkins. And he made, you know, he made some serious coin that night. But for, what was it, like maybe 50 60 guys went with him to this place and they all had a ball and the bar was happy because they made a lot of money on beer. Tom was happy because he walked away with like $2,500 for drinking beer in, a, in, a, in Burbank for one evening. So, I mean, that is, it, there's always something and I, you know what is happening and I'm old enough to notice it more than you, I think, is that all the things that people put me down for when I was growing up for liking are now considered pop culture icons. And I'm not just talking Dracula, Frankenstein, and the mummy. I'm talking, you know, Pinhead and Freddy Krueger and Jason and Michael Myers and, and you know, the Catholic Church and all its creepy <laughs> nuns and pedophilic priests, you know, that are going to populate horror movies for the next 200 years if somebody doesn't put an end to it in one way or another. I don't know. I mean, I just saw The Nun, which I didn't like at all. I've actually known nuns like that. What's so what's so horrifying about that? But no, I mean, do you like religious horror movies? That's a good subject. I mean, religious horror movies require either that you believe in God or that you believe in the devil or that if you believe in either one, then that makes the other one possible. But I don't know. It just depends on the I mean, The Exorcist being the number one, I guess. Right. Um, I do. I mean, I think they're kind of hit or miss, but I think they're fascinating. When like you see the Omen movie. Right. Well, when you watch, you know, a movie that's about exorcism, it's like the same thing with zombies. You, it's a formula and it's who can make that interesting again yeah. or find a new way to make yeah. it interesting. Um, and I think there's people that do and they it often can fly under the radar. 
Um, well, you know, when you live in Hollywood like I do, and you see people talking in tongues and you know doing all walking on, on all fours like an like a spider and everything, that's just another day in Hollywood. I have no <laughs> idea whether they're possessed or not. But so for me, you got to do a little more than that. The talk and you know like. A wonderful evening for an exorcist, la plume de matante kind of thing. Right, you know? right, right. Um, one that I saw recently that I thought was pretty good, I mean, it's a couple years old, but I, I didn't see it when it came out, was The Quiet Ones. How funny you said that. That's from the paranormal things, right? No, no, I'm thinking of The Marked Ones. The Quiet Ones is takes place in the UK, and it's about like a, a professor who has a subject that he wants to record uh, doing an exorcism on, and it, it kind of plays with the idea is the, the, the subject mentally ill or not. Wait a minute, I don't think I've seen and it. Quiet. It takes like, place, how old is it? it? I think it came out like 2012 ish. Around, was. I was thinking of that paranormal activity movie, God Help Us, number five, which is called The Marked Ones. It's actually not a bad movie, and if you guys are fans of the paranormal activity franchise, the one, the number five that takes place in East LA explains how why the whole thing is what it is because it's a you know it's it's about the brujas in in east la and i had no idea oh interesting. and and uh i got a copy of it you know normally i didn't like that series too much because it was all about you know things in your swimming pool that are possessed and stuff but or your dog disappears and doesn't come back and but this one was i was and i love the fact that it took place in east la and we got into some of the uh, Santa Rhea witchcraft things that go on there, which is a little like uh, Possession of Joel Delaney or The Believers or any of those movies that take voodoo, Serpent in the Rainbow. Right. See, now those kind of zombie, but there's two different kinds of zombie movies. There are what I just described and then uh, The Walking Dead. Right. So, or World War Z. I mean, there is, it's interesting to me, I, I find the ones where the zombies have a little bit more to do. Yeah, yeah, no. For, I don't know. The, I mean, the mindless thing, like George Romero knocked that out of the park, so how are you going to come back? And Well, apparently, what is, how many seasons of Walking Dead are we looking at? Not to mention the spinoff, not to mention, although well, they just canceled World War Z Part 2. Well, but yeah, I guess with The Walking Dead, what they did was they made it more about the people than the zombies. At first, it was about that because... It came, I think Walking Dead came. Well, can you imagine a series about the zombies? <laughs> that would be kind of a short one. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, they, I think today they announced that there's a new spinoff of The Walking Dead. Yeah. Not just Fear the Walking Dead. They're doing a, a, another one. So it's it's from my Well, own. you know, the longevity of these shows. Like, I mean, Supernatural is finally calling it a day after 15 years. Everyone is so rich, they can't possibly care. <laughs> and they're all executive producers of this show. Now there's this Supernatural, and then Game of Thrones is coming to an end finally. And remember when The Sopranos ended? I mean, everything does come to an end. Um, but the fact that they could get that many seasons out of it says something about what the public wants. With, with The Walking Dead? Yeah. I, I think NPR had an episode where they were talking about how theoretically The Walking Dead could just go on forever because you can always have new people dealing with the oh, yeah. zombie apocalypse. Oh, yeah. So that might explain some of the, the reason for a spinoff. But um, what I was going to say is what's fascinating to me is it's going to be filmed in Virginia, where I'm from. So I don't know if that's also taking place there, but that was a point of interest. For it, but um, David, let's get back to you, man. Um, so t break us down your story and how you got to be where you are. And well, I'm the classic kind of monster kid. I grew up, uh, you know, watching horror movies when I was very small on television, and when I was very small, Universal had repackaged all of their you know, their classic monsters into what they call shock theater. And every Saturday night at 10 o'clock, they would show Ghost of Frankenstein. Frankenstein means when I'd never seen these pictures before. I'd never heard of them. And all of a sudden, I'm watching this stuff. First time I saw Dracula, I think I was like five years old, four years old. And I was completely uh, just bedazzled by it all. And of course, you know, I was brought up a Catholic. So I was already, as a very young kid, steeped in mysticism and incense and 
supernatural mysteries and uh, visitations by angels and uh, definitely a whole geography of what hell is, nine circles, the whole enchilada. So the movies, the horror movies kind of all bought into it, especially when I'm looking at Dracula and they're brandishing crosses to make him, you know, like I noticed years later, with Re Re Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, they've got, got Peter Cushing. They, they're in China, and he goes, well, I don't think the crucifix is going to work here. And Cushing very quickly says, I ah, know here the Lord Buddha is what you... <laughs> so I guess you just have to flash this fat little guy at a vampire, and it repels his... Anyway, I, I digress. <laughs> so I started watching these movies when I was... And then by the time I got into grade school, I was like a total fan, and I was also hitting... The theaters, because remember, I was a little kid in the very late 50s and 60s where all these movies, all the insect movies, the, the threat of atomic bomb movies where everything was getting enlarged by radiation, uh, the end of the, the horror cycle of Universal where Abbott and Costello finally meet Frankenstein and we go from that to Tarantula, Day the Earth Stood Still, Forbidden Planet. We then edge into the 60s with return of, with the night of the living dead psycho psycho changes the landscape of everything 1960 you look at every movie that came out after 1960 and you will see the influence of hitchcock's movie i'm just telling you in the strangest ways because it opened the door to psychology and what really is a serial killer because remember ed gein is responsible for so much you know not only psycho but texas chainsaw massacre and all of it so this is the environment I'm growing up in. And of course, by the time I'm in high school, the 60s are almost over and I'm kind of in the counterculture thing. So all of a sudden now I'm, I'm taking drugs, I'm getting ready to go into college, horror movies have changed, Vincent Price is becoming passe, Witchfinder General comes out and everybody's like shocked at the violence. But you have to understand that like Psycho and Night of the Living Dead, Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch opened the door for naturalistic violence. From that moment on, when you shot somebody, you see that it's not just, you know, it's not bloodless. In fact, Wild Bunch was just like the, the it, it lowered the bar for people to go even further. And then of course, we come to a period where from Euro trash into, you know, after you see everything, you know, that was my problem, Peter, was I'd seen all the Hammer films a million times, all the Universal films a million times. Then I meet my friend Tim Lucas, who's like, I, by the time I meet Tim, he's in his fourth issue of Video Watchdog. So we're talking Mario Bava. Little did I know I was talking to a man that was going to write this goddamn international phone book on Mario Bava. It's a giant 10-pound book, which took like 30 years to write. But he finished it, and it's off, and it's great. Uh, but I've known Tim since that period of time with Video Watchdog. And Video Watchdog and Fangoria and these other magazines, particularly, I, I, how can I leave out Famous Monsters of Film? Right, right, right. I grew up with Famous Monsters. And I also grew up with Forrest J. Ackerman. When I was about 13 years old, my mom and I were in Los Angeles staying at the Biltmore Hotel, and I was reading Famous Monsters. It was like one of the early issues. And I realized I had his address on Sherburne Drive. And I said to my mom, I want to go visit Forrest Ackerman. She said, you're not going to that man's house by yourself. And I said, well, you want to come with me? And she goes, no. And I said, well, you just have to trust me on this. So she put me in a cab, and I, I was taken over to Forrest's, and there was a whole group of people there. And uh, what an experience that was, going into a grown man's house that was filled to the rim with horror memorabilia, magazines, books. I'd never seen movie posters before. Oh, or wow. movie stills. Right. And of course, the minute I got my hands on my first 8x10, thanks to him, that was the beginning of a lifelong obsession with collecting that, which, of course, I'm so grateful to this day because, you know, I actually live off my archive now that I started way back when Famous Monsters was first. So, you know, when I won my Rondo for Monster Kid of the Year thing, thing or Monster Hall of Fame, I really am a Monster Kid because <laughs> I go back to when Forey's Magazine was new when American International Pictures and Hammer Films of England were doing their first run of classic movies. And here I am all this time later, and we're still, you know, monsters are bigger than ever. The monsters that I grew up with are now legendary, iconic things. And uh, 
I don't know. And now for you, it's probably very different because you're from a different era from me. But you did you get into it through television or like yeah. going to the movies when you were little? Yeah, I mean, my mom always was like, when are you going to outgrow this stuff? You know, that, that whole kind of thing. But I had a cousin who, when I was little, I think the first two horror movies I can really wrap my have a memory of were Poltergeist and Neymar on Elm Street. Um, I just remembered the pool scene in Poltergeist with the corpses, you know, that left an impression, the television, just bits and pieces. I mean, obviously I've seen it a bunch of times since, since then. But with Nightmare on Elm Street, my cousin, who was a few years older, he's living with us, he had Elm Street on and he would made me watch it and I was terrified, but I was also curious. So I'd like run in the other room and then peek my head back in and kind of do one of these things. And I thought it was great. And so then he would buy me like Fangoria and I was like, this is awesome. Um, but a huge game changer and the, the horror for me was watching Night of the Living Dead on like USA when I was probably like eight or nine or something because it was a black and white film. And you know, absolutely. That's a very good point because black and white, a lot of people don't like black and white now, but I think black and white's terrific. Oh, no, no, I agree with you. I, but as a little kid being like, no, color is cool, but it just starts and I couldn't stop watching it. I was like, holy shit, what is this? Well, compare it to the remake that was in color. I mean, it right. doesn't, I think the original still holds up better. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the remake is actually pretty good. And the funny thing was, was the remake came out only a couple years after that when I was already like obsessed with zombies. And I was like, wait a minute, what? Because I remember seeing the ad for it on TV and I was like, what the hell is this? Wait, I've seen this, but this is different because I was too young to understand that they made remakes of, of movies. Yeah. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'll watch it in color now too. You know? Did you ever watch any of the Mexican horror movies from Azteca that were on TV for a while that were all vampires and they were very stylized? You know, the vampires had really long teeth and the women had really outrageous, you know, they were all like really stacked and wearing Victoria's Secret kind of nightgowns around lots of fog and very Catholic, but... I uh, feel like that, that or the Brainiac, any of those weird. I, I haven't seen the Brainiac. Um, I feel like I've been exposed to that when I was younger because USA was kind of like a go-to for just having. Brain they used Gordon. to show the gay, uh, uh, K. Gordon Murray version. I just brought that up because I just think that um, when Hammer Films Horror of Dracula came out in '58, every other country had their own vampire. Because it's around the same time that El Vampiro came out in Mexico and about the same, you know, and then the Japanese did a, uh, a, a vampire, you know, those things where the vampire's eyes turn gold. It's really interesting to see those kind of different kind of each country doing their different. Kind yeah, of, yeah. Different cultural. But they've it. just remade what made me think of the Mexican movies. I just saw a poster coming over here for La Lorena. Yeah. yeah. Now, they did the curse of that. Curse of La Lorena was a, is an Azteca movie from the 60s, but now they've remade it from the people that brought you the Conjuring franchise. Right, right, right. Or, you know, however you want to look at that. But do you, do, do you think, I mean, it's, I think it's important to try and find different mythologies to, to mine because we've kind of exhausted Dracula and Frankenstein. We've exhausted zombies. And we've kind of, exa I don't ever want to see another vampire thing where he's a detective. <laughs> Jesus Christ. There's been like four television series with the vampire's detective going way back to Nick Knight and uh, uh, there's, I, there's three or four others I'm, I'm forgetting kind of mercifully. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. I think um, mining from different cultures and mythology is, is important. I, I'm a writer um, and when I was coming up with a concept for a show, I was like, I want to do this an exorcism gone wrong. And it wasn't because they're dealing with a demon, but I was like dealing with a, a gin. I was like, that could be something fun to explore because I don't know that much about gins. You know, that's like the basis. Have you for seen genes. American Gods? I've, I've seen. You've seen of the, the first, first season of American Gods. I've seen about half of the first season. Did you see episode? Was it four where the taxi driver meets a gin where he gets in a cab? Yes. Yeah. 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 I didn't know anything about gens either, but I'm telling you, those gens got around. <laughs> that was the most jaw-dropping episode of that series, which is, I, I'm, I'm waiting to see the second one. But you've got to, this is an interesting point too. I don't know if you've watched the second season of Sabrina. But I, was, there, I actually haven't seen any of it yet. Sabrina is like Buffy in the sense that 
I didn't want to watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer when the series came out because the movie was not very good. It took Gordon Melton, who was an expert in vampire mythology and a professor at Santa Barbara, at UC Santa Barbara, that said to me, you have to watch this show. It's amazing. And I started watching the TV series Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the episode in which her mother dies and she has to confront all these different kind of very human situations. All of a sudden I realized as a writer, you will appreciate the fact that the, the series was beautifully written. And all the characters were fleshed out and three-dimensional. And this is a fucking vampire document or a series. And it's really good. Sabrina is not quite as realistic because it takes place totally in a comic book world. But what I find fascinating about it as a lapsed Catholic is how they put the church way down. Because remember, this is all about Satanism. And they say things like, well, you know, the Lord Satan came to our came to our potluck dinner the other night. When was the last time Jesus showed up in anything at the Catholic Church? <laughs> and I mean, in a, in a, in the era of Trump, we are getting this very kind of edgy, un 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 PC kind of uh, storytelling. It's but you know it's like Ryan Murphy's shows. You know they're all very they really are cutting edge and dealing with all the taboo subjects, whether it's homosexuality, incest, cannibalism whatever bestiality you name it nothing is off the off the off the table anymore right i mean as if you were writing a cable show now you wouldn't be inhibited by any any kind of like i can't do this well that's actually the interesting thing because you think of network and you're like oh, there's so but many cables and other stuff yeah right cable anything goes now i mean yeah they keep pushing the bar with that and it's really impressive i mean I don't know what Game of Thrones kind of like. Well, Game of Thrones, I've never, I will never, because I only saw a couple. What episode do I see for the first time is the scene where the guy who plays Aquaman is like pounding this girl into the ground in a tent. And I'm like, what? I thought it was porn for a minute. What the hell is this? That's the first time I ever saw Jason. Have, so you've only seen a couple episodes I've only, of Game of I have never, I'll tell you what's wrong with Game of Thrones. Whenever I'm in a room with people that are watching it, they're so into it that I'm completely lost. Right. There's no way I can catch up because it's what nine years of shows I need. To, it's just hopeless. Well, I would say if, if you can get your hands on the first season, watch that because that did something that I had never seen on television that kind of blew my mind because I was like, how are you going to continue this show? And they found a great way to do that and invest you and – that's just from like a story. So I, yeah, I think seeing the first season would probably help. I mean, the first episode has kind of an interesting cliffhanger at the end, but the first season, I, I'm not going to spoil it for people that are on the fence or I have some friends that I'm always like, you need to just watch this because there's a reason why the world's obsessed with it. It's kind of got that Breaking Bad mojo. Um, well, I love Breaking Bad. That If you ever knew anyone that that had to deal with drugs at all, I was stunned by how realistic that show was and the actor that played jesse who became a star right him, right right uh his his performance was just was it ben foster no no, no it's it was aaron a, aaron paul thank you yeah aaron paul incredible but you know brian made him a star everyone in that was top of their game yeah and that stuff with the mexican cartel that was, I was unforgettable right yeah i mean breaking bad was it was totally, and I, you know what? For what it's worth, I like weeds. Okay. By the time this woman winds up running a Mexican cartel herself, I mean, it's like eight. This went eight or nine seasons, too. Right, right. You know, but then there are some shows where, you know, you know, you can't please everybody. But I do think there's enough edgy, really cutting edge stuff now. I, I'll tell you what I'm, I'm thinking in terms of film. I think that the really cutting edge stuff is on cable. Yeah, feature certainly. films are not remotely as edgy as the movie as the stuff I've seen on cable. For the most part. For the most part, I mean, still some independent movies will still. Oh yeah, go, but I mean, you got to you got to look for those. And you know, the trouble is, the market is so overwhelmed. And I say this to our friends that are making indie horror. There is so much of it now. I would almost suggest if you're going to make a if you're going to enter into this to try and come up with a different genre just to give yourself a, 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 a something that is unique because how many times can you just keep doing the same stuff? 
I mean, I mean, if everyone, if you've got it in your head, you want to make a horror movie, nothing's going to stop you. But if you just make the same old thing, it's just going to get lost in the shuffle. But it depends on what your motive is, I guess. Right. One, one of the last movies I saw that I really liked, and it seems to be kind of a polarizing opinion because it's based on a true story, is Lords of Chaos with the death metal bands. Because that's like a biopic of a band that kind of does it with a wink, but it's also a horror movie. Like, because the this, the actual story of what happened was insanely fucked up. You, do you, are you familiar with I've that? Been, I looked at the, you know, I've been reading about it. I haven't seen it yet. It's, when they show the violence, they linger on it. And it's very realistic. It's not like, like the it, Green Room. It's, so, so Jeremy, who did Green Room, told me something interesting about how he approached the violence in that. Did you see Green Room? Of course, yeah. So, he's like, anytime it's someone dies it's like he'll just show it like boom and you'll just be like in your face and it's over but anytime it's like a wound that doesn't kill the person he'll he'll linger on it that was kind of like his little subtle way of getting these reactions out of people um with lords of chaos with those scenes they make you watch it and feel it and just it hangs in the air for a second so it's 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 so it's disturbing yeah, it's it's disturbing in the one of the more like Henry Porter of a serial killer kind of thing, or yeah, because there's also this kind of whiplash element where it's like the student tries to best the teacher, and that student starts off as kind of a, a dork. He's uh, he's his name is Varg, and he's an actual person, and I don't think he he liked how he was portrayed in the movie, but then he becomes a very uh, uneasy character, and like I thought he did a good job. At, at, well, I'm going to check it out. I mean, I enjoyed uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Peter recommended Warlord to me. And Overlord. he recommended it to me at a time when it was still playing at the Arc Light. Overlord, David. Overlord. What did I say? You said Warlord. Warlord. Close enough. Never mind. Yeah, Warlord's another movie, which you don't want to see. That's an old Charlton Heston movie, I think. No, Overlord, which, you know, once again, movies that take place in World War II are just everywhere and have always have been but this one really took some turns yeah that that i wasn't expecting and i really enjoyed it and it's very gory but you know i think we have to kind of go pre-hostile and after and post-hostile because hostile opened the door for what was known as por torture porn. Right, right i mean there were instances of cannibal holocaust and slave the cannibal gods and all those kind of italian kind of European torture porn movies. Uh, but then you go back to Herschel Gordon Lewis, it's there too. But the more stylized it is, you know, I mean, I did, I worked on this big box set of Herschel Gordon Lewis from Arrow in England, which, you know, they can't find all these, you know, they've got 27 discs, everything Herschel Gordon Lewis ever did. Wow. And what I did for them, I didn't do a commentary because it really wouldn't have been appropriate for me, but I did these uh, documentaries where they wanted a voice. So they did the 2000 Maniacs. They wanted somebody to sound like Tennessee Williams. And so I was chosen. But how I got chosen is interesting because ori originally Anton Yeltsin was going to do these because Anton's girlfriend was running was running the company that was putting the supplementals together. And three weeks or two weeks before they were going to go into the studio, Anton died in a freak accident where his car ran over him. Which, speaking of the green room, yeah. the sweetest guy, had everything going for him. He had Star Trek, he had movies, he had a girlfriend. It was just like, what? And then it's over. <clears throat> so in any case, he was to have done the 2000 Maniacs and Color Me blood red he was going to do these documentary things around it do the voice so my friend elijah drenner said can you do this and since i never say no i you know i thought well i've always lo loved the idea of doing strange voices and stuff because i like to mimic things so i put it together and I, i'll give elijah credit he sat down like we're sitting now only i was reading this text and he was playing with echo chambers and all this stuff so when I heard the final result, it was really good. But there again, when I was like a kid and going to drive-ins, which of course is a lost art now, they were playing 2000 Maniacs and uh, 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 Blood Feast. 
But I was afraid to see them because I thought they were going to be too. But what did I know? I mean, of course, in Blood Feast, it's just all uh, it's just all entrails from a delicatessen with right, some red right. ketchup on. But then you come to Hostel years later, <laughs> and it's decidedly not. Although that movie is really based on an old 1930s film called The Most Dangerous Game, because no matter how you jazz it up, and I would like to maybe, I, well, I'm not fond of that, that franchise, but the one that took place in Las Vegas might have been interesting, because I, of the way I feel about Las Vegas. I right, mean, right. You know, if anyone's going to get fucked up there, it's going to be, yeah. I can see that working in the underbelly of Vegas, you know, having some secret society. And it's an interesting idea, you know, Starry Eyes kind of does that too. Interestingly enough, Peter and I went to see Pet Cemetery together, and the people that put that together, the remake, also did Starry Eyes, which is a movie about Hollywood and uh, Satanism in a way. Um, although P Pet Cemetery is never clear on what supernatural force brings the dead back to life. But in every instance, and I go back to W.W. Jacobs. David, the, pause one second. Well, there's going to be spoilers for the new Pet Cemetery remake, so just a heads up. Am I going to do a spoiler? Well, you, you can, you can. I want to. Well, give well you if I do, but what I was going to say is that it's, there is never, it, it, whether it's The Monkey's Paw or Death Dream, that movie about the Vietnam vet that comes back, which is also The Monkey's Paw, every single instance of retelling this story, the people that come back are never any good. Right. Never any good. And I just don't understand if everyone knows this. It's like an alien movie where someone sticks their head in that pod. The whole audience is going, don't put your head in there. And he puts his head in there. And of course. Right, right. Well, uh, what I've said this before about Stephen King and his, his take on that that I think is fascinating is he's taking people's vulnerability and grief and just weaponizing it and he really using it against the characters and the, the audience because it's such a, a touchy subject. Um, well, I think that's why seances were so popular at the turn of the century and all. And even everyone wants to have a belief in life after death. Right. Even if you look at Douglas, uh, uh, what is it? Brainstorm, which was Natalie Wood's last movie. That's about someone trying to document what happens to you when you die. And in the case of that, she's wearing something that's recording her thoughts so when you play that back, you go through the death process. Oh, and wow. that gave uh, Douglas, uh, the special effects guy, uh, who, was, who was the fellow that worked on Brainstorm that, uh, uh, anyway, uh, they spent a lot of money on it, but Natalie died before it was finished. And I don't know if all her scenes were completed, but there's something very disturbing about talking about life after death. White Noise does that too. And in White Noise, they do the same thing in a way with Pet Cemetery. And when you start making out those figures and you realize they're coming to you from the other side, they bear you malice. Right. They're, yeah. not, they're not there to just let you know everything's fine. Right. Uh, that's a lot more interesting, I think. I think so too. But, you know, the whole idea of surviving personality... Uh, I went to see that Winchester movie that Helen Mirren made, which everyone dislike for is, how was that? it wasn't terrible okay. i mean it, it you i could see where it was going like about 40 less than 40 minutes into it but you know she's a very good actress and it's an interesting idea that you know what was going on why was she you know her belief at least the the short version was that as long as she built onto the house uh she wouldn't die Right. But then you look at the movie and there's a whole other reason why she kept building rooms onto it. Really? Yeah. But I don't want to spoil that because somebody might rent it. I don't know. It came and went. Right. No, I, you know, I mean, everything. I run to see things at the arc light because I'm afraid it's going to be gone in the next. Because, you know, I've missed a lot. I, I think it's good to see them in a theater if you can. Because you know what it's like in the era of cell. You, know, you, get, you take it home to watch it. You'll get distracted. You'll play with your phone. You'll. But if you're in a movie theater... You're there for the, you know, which is why I think seeing Pet Cemetery in a theater was better. I wouldn't have wanted a screener of that, would you? No, no, guys? it was, it, I, we definitely got great crowd reactions, you know. There were some jokes, that had the more jolting moments, everything. We also, what was funny to me was the, the cute, thank you for taking me, by the way, David. Um, they really 
rolled out the red carpet for that because there was free popcorn, free soda. You got a free T-shirt. Selfies. Print. Yeah, like posters. the selfie experience. And then there's a QA and a with the directors, which was interesting. But – through the whole movie, I wanna I love the Ramon song Pet Cemetery, and right as the credits kicked on, they killed the sound to have the Q and A. So um, you missed the you I missed, missed the song, uh, but uh, even one of the directors was like, "Oh come on!" They wanted to hear the you know a cover version of it. I've heard it since, so whatever, we're good. But I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a great experience seeing that. And well, you know, people really love the original. And I'm, you know, and I, I mean, I think we both know what was that a few days ago. There's been a lot. I've been reading a lot of things online that weren't all the hearts and flowers about right. it. But of course, uh, I don't think you can please anybody. It's just the whole Facebook thing. If I put a post up that I like a movie, why do people go on there and say, that, well, I hated that? Well, OK, <laughs> but did you read what I wrote? Right. That, I don't want to hear why you hated it. I only want you to respond if you like. But you know, what are you going to do? So, yeah, yeah. Or unless, you know, if you're going to talk shit on something, have a good reason to. Or if you're going to praise something, have a good reason to. You know, it's – everyone's got – Well, it's very things. awkward to say anything nasty about a movie like that when the two directors are friends of everyone we know. Right, right. I mean, literally. Yeah. They, they, I mean, we've had a lot of people – since Trivia started in 2013, which was over at the Jump Cut Cafe and now it's a blast from the past in Burbank – is that it's increased in size to where when we started, we were in a tiny little kind of coffee shop, bakery, hole in the wall off Ventura Boulevard, I think, that was, you know, couldn't seat more than 50 people, yet we got a lot more people yeah. in there than normally would have. But now we're in like a former bank building, and we've got <laughs> nearly 200 people that join us yeah. every, once a month, and we're doing it next Thursday. It's yeah. if, if you're into horror and you're in Los Angeles, you should Come and join definitely us. check out Dead Right Trivia. It's it's a blast. It's very hard. Um, it's great it's too having, hard. It's great having <laughs> David on your team when they go back in time and go yeah. from the 60s and all this stuff. Because most people are just like, okay, 80s. Or it's there. all 80s, which I know fuck all about. So I'm just sit there and but, wait for – for Pat and Don to come up. But, you know, we have a great time. And But what astonishes me is the people in that room that know this this arcane ephemera is the only way I can call it, like Freddy Krueger's social security number. <laughs> or, you know, I'm sorry. I mean, like, what was the song that was playing in the third reel of, uh, you know, Friday the 13th Part 4? Well, that implies that you've seen these sequels more than once. For me to get through the Friday the 13th franchise in its entirety does not bode well for repeat viewings of certain... I mean, I like Halloween 3. When I liked Halloween 3, nobody liked it. Now everybody likes it. So, you know, sometimes if you just hold out long enough, people, you, you're, you know... But hey, you know what, though, guys? Why does everyone have to like everything? I'm perfectly fine if you don't like something that I do. But there's a Facebook kind of thingy where you, you wind up fighting with people, especially in the horror genre. Everyone's so passionate. Because everyone thinks that they have the the authority on the genre, I think. They take I hate ownership that. I hate it. that. Yeah, it's, it's very it's, widespread, I'm afraid to say. Especially when you do audio commentaries like I do, if you're doing something. Look, if they can find someone that's written a book on this movie, fine, go get them. But if you go get me, you know, I'll do the best I can. But if the Margaret Herrick doesn't have it, I have to I have to really find people. I have to do a lot of research because the worst thing you can do in an audio commentary is depend on the IMDb because it's a minefield of misinformation. Like my birth, it's completely wrong. Take 10 years off of it. And, you know, <laughs> what an idiot I was to put anything on the IMDb. Well, David, what are some of the – your – the movies you've done commentary on that you really liked or had a lot of had a blast with. Okay, I can tell you that real fast because uh, I enjoyed doing Theater of Blood because I did that with my good friend the late Nick Redman who had a company called Twilight Time. Uh, I enjoy Vincent Price was a friend of mine and and Theater of Blood was one of his favorite movies and it's one of his best movies. So I put a lot of my own you know kind of uh, emotions into that. So that's a special one for me. Female on the Beach with Joan Crawford, simply because I love Joan Crawford and Female on the Beach is hilarious. And it's shot like a horror movie. In fact, it's kind of like Joan Crawford's version of the she-creature 
except there's no monster in it. There's just Joan and a bottle of scotch. So there you go. So I love doing that. And I did that with my friend, David Dakota, who was you know a great pal. And he makes, uh, uh, he, he's a really fascinating guy because he's been in the business for years and he's directed dozens and dozens and dozens of movies. And he loves horror movies. And uh, he's, you know, so we have a lot of fun doing these. So the, uh, Theater of Blood, Female on the Beach, um, I won a, a rondo with Derek Botello for doing Dario Argento Suspiria, but the problem with me when I do these is I can never watch the movie again if I've done because I've just seen it so many times. Roman Polanski's Fearless Vampire Killers I can't watch anymore because I've just seen it way too many times. Uh, Bride of Frankenstein I can't watch it. I just know every frame of it. Now a movie like Lolita. I can watch over and over. It's very funny. It's like music. Right. When there's a famous story where Fritz Lang couldn't understand why someone was going to see his movies over and over again. And he said, well, maestro, it's like music. It's like, why wouldn't I listen to Beethoven more than once? Or why wouldn't I? And that's a very good point, which Fritz Lang had to stop and think for a minute. In other words, movies are like music. There are certain movies that you put on. and you. I'm that way. And there are even guilty pleasure movies like The Lost Boys. If that comes on TV, I will watch it. I will watch all of it. There I, are not a lot of movies I'll do that with. I was, I was actually going to comment on The Lost Boys because that's one of my favorite movies. And I don't remember the last time I sat down to watch it. But if it was playing, I think You'd I would snap it. right into it. Yeah. Um, and it's funny you brought up the music to tie this back to Green Room. The island band was a big part of that. It's like, yeah, if you're on a deserted island... What, what band would you want to be able to listen to? And I realized, I'm like, I, I wouldn't want to listen to one of my favorite bands because I'd burn them out and I already know all their stuff. It'd have to be someone I kind of like and has a huge library and new stuff to explore. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a variation of things, and, and, but it's all very personal. And I do think movies are like music. But you know what? I mean, let me give you a case in point. I got a lot of movies at home. I've got like a wall. I mean, how many guys? We, I mean, I look on Facebook. Dude, everybody's got a, a giant film library. Right. I run into people at Amoeba. In Los Angeles, we have this uh, amazing store called Amoeba Records where you can buy DVDs, T-shirts, vinyl, uh, books, you name it. And uh, I hope this store relocates because they're losing their lease there. But that's another Los Angeles story that's still... On it's still a continuing story, but my point is, is that uh, you just have to, uh, uh, if you like something, you really don't have to account to anybody for why. It's just that's your, you know. I mean, I love all of the movies we've been discussing, but there are some of them that I just can't watch anymore, right. and yet some of them that I can. And there's no, it doesn't mean it's a bad movie. It just means that. Uh, but what my point was with having all these movies. I will like look at a wall of movies and go, what am I going to watch tonight? Yeah. And I'll look at, I mean, I'm looking at like 40, I can't pick out of 200 titles, one movie to watch because I'll start looking at the movie and I'll replay it in my mind or something. Or, you know, like the other day I was going through my, VA, uh, you know, non Blu-rays and I came across Disney's The Black Hole. I thought, I haven't watched this in a long time. Is it really as awful as everyone said? I enjoyed it. You know, I was saying it was just an afternoon and I liked the music and I thought Anthony Perkins was really spooky and strange and Maximilian Schell. But, you know, sometimes it takes revisiting a movie. Because have you ever seen movies that you didn't like the first time around that you kind of like came around to later on, maybe through a friend or somebody making you watch it over again? Or... There was some movie, and I can't think of it right now, that I started off not liking it, and by the end, I loved it. It wasn't like, quite the same thing. It was uh, actually, it was uh, Summer of 84. Have you heard of that? Of course. So so when I first started watching it, I was like, this is just kind of Summer of 84 is The Summer Knows, Michel Legrand song. That that's, that's what it's named after? I think so. I'll have to... I'll have this to... is the one where the kid thinks his neighbor's a serial killer? No. No. I'm thinking of something else. The summer of 84? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like it takes place in somewhere in Oregon, I think. And it's like three well, of kids. Of course it's I'm, Oregon. <laughs> well, it's a bunch of, you know, like 
kids that are like 12 or 13 and one of them thinks his neighbor is a serial killer. And I was like, all right, this is just kind of like Stranger Things. Here's Well, it's it's Rear Window. It's Hitchcock's Rear Window, too. I mean, or you think or any movie where you suspect somebody is Right, right. But what and so I th- I was like, all right, well, here's the all The Burbs is like that in a way. Yeah, for sure. But the thing about it was it has a lot of like, all right, here comes all the 80s references and stuff. But then the story just – it they did a really good job of it. And I, I – at the end, you think there's only two outcomes that could possibly happen and they found another way to do that that was even more disturbing than what I thought that I applauded for. So I ended up not liking it and then just really loving it. Well, with The Green Room, I was really amazed with Patrick Stewart. Yeah. But I went in there to see Anton and and – uh, then Patrick Stewart was giving such a, a really uh, edgy performance, and uh, but sometimes you really have. I'll give you an example. I went to see Death Proof, the Quentin Tarantino movie with Kurt Russell. I didn't like it the first time. Then I read this. It was so funny because you remember when that movie came out. This friend of mine named Eric Kruston, who was a great writer, he has a, a website called Acidemic, and I recommend Acidemic film of a uh, film journal journal of film and movies or whatever that's i'll give you the right title for it in a minute but in any case he wrote this amazing review of death proof where he was comparing it to old burt reynolds movies and all this other references that i wasn't getting so i watched it again after having read his thing and all of a sudden i realized i really enjoyed it and the music cues in it are really interesting because it's like two different movies put together. There's the scene where Kurt Russell's introduced and he finally kills the first girl and then there's the other part of the movie. Right. In both sections, Quentin uses music cues that are all from other movies. And what I found fascinating in the second half of it were all the cues he took from William Friedkin's Cruising <laughs> and put okay. in the scene where they go into the 7-Eleven and she buys the Italian Vogue. So, see, I know this movie really well now, but I started out not liking it. And I would, now I've got it in my collection and I've seen it countless times. So, but it is funny, you know, sometimes you need somebody to point something out. Right. To you. Well, yeah, no, I need to revisit it. I mean, I really like Planet Terror because I saw them like the back. Now, back. see, I was just, I thought I like Death Proof more. Now you like Death Proof more. Well, yeah, of course, a different director. Yeah, yeah. So now I should, because I was like, I, Kurt Russell is one of those actors who's, knows how to pick movies like most of the movies i've seen with him are fucking great so death proof i was kind of like it was cool but if they had hired at that time burt reynolds to play the kurt russell part it would have been the perfect match for tarantino because of of Smokey and the bandit and all those movies. oh right time but see because see he had more of that because the way quentin is with with film history and how he likes everything to be like this once upon a time in hollywood which I don't know if you've seen the trailer for it, but yeah. I'm really, I'm hoping it's going to be good. But, you know, we'll all go see it regardless. But right. I do hope he doesn't, like, reinvent Sharon Tate not dying. <laughs> because that did cross my mind after Inglorious Bastards, where Hitler's murdered in a theater. Right, so, right, right. You know, in other words, you can reinvent anything you want, of course. But with the Sharon Tate thing, I don't know. It's, well, yeah, it's, it's a very personal story to Hollywood, so that would seem kind of, I don't know, maybe not tone deaf, but just a very weird thing to do. Well, I gave an award to this movie called The Haunting of Sharon Tate with Hilary Duff playing Sharon Tate. And i am it's utterly tasteless. And it's offensive to the family. And it's just wrong. It's just wrong, wrong, wrong. And the next movie they want to do is The Haunting of Nicole Simpson. Jeez. So... You know, I said this a long time ago with the Kennedy assassination. One day we're going to get a movie where we see Jack Kennedy's head blown off in full close-up. And sure enough, when they did that movie called Jackie a couple of years ago, they reenact the assassination. So you actually see his head going in her lap. And she's more covered in blood than she actually is in the Zagruber footage. But the thing is with... The murder of Sharon Tate, we've never had anyone go into that house. And even Helter Skelter, they, it was all off camera. Maybe a few like flashbacks. But uh, apparently Sharon Tate had a dream involving a home invasion weeks before it actually happened to her. And I didn't know this is a story that's been circulating around. So that was part of the 
motive for them doing the haunting of Sharon Tate. And I'm wondering if this has something to do with why Quentin was so fascinated with 1969, which of course is a, a number of things happened in 69, right, right, right. including Altamont. But the premier thing that happened that destroyed the summer of love was the advent of Charles Manson, because all of a sudden the image of a hippie, instead of holding flowers in a joint, he's got a, he's got a machete and a, you know, it's just the demonizing of the hippie movement was just the it, Altamont and Manson just that was a, a sucker punch and it was gone. It was gone. Because Easy Rider also is a movie that people don't really talk about as a game changer. But Easy Rider blew the dust out of Hollywood because that movie made so much money and it was so counterculture and it was totally driven by the soundtrack. You take the soundtrack away from Easy Rider, and it's not half the experience it is with it. And I think about how many horror movies that we like from the 80s and 90s that are fueled by, by the soundtrack. The soundtrack. Yeah. I mean, if you go and even look at, speaking of these cable shows like Supernatural or even Smallville, dude, they sell more soundtrack shit than they do DVDs of the, of the series. Right, yeah. I mean, They've I, got a song for every emotion. Well, I, I will say my favorite song of all time is anything anything by drama rama and that came to me when i watched nightmare on Elm street four as okay, a little kid see, that's a good and, and that i was like this this is a song and i've I, after moving to hollywood i'm kind of like over it because i hear it fucking everywhere but uh yeah i mean soundtracks were crucial to me like the lost boys return of living dead all that stuff or take a song like Summer Breeze by Seals and Croft, which was reinvented for I saw I know still know what you did last summer by Marilyn Manson. I, so you can take a song Summer Breeze, it's supposed to be like a lilting kind of lullaby, and Marilyn Manson gets a hold of it. It's an apocalyptic freak out song. Right. Yeah, the uh the Manson cover of Sweet Dreams. Oh it, once and, again, yeah, the, the Manson cover of just about but he's covered like Summer Breeze and that, and probably some others we haven't. He's of. covered the Lost Boy, a Cry Little Sister, but I don't think he. No, didn't quite. Have well, the same nothing, topic. nothing is going to ever. I mean, I still believe changed everyone's lives, and you know that dude was at one of the Monster Palooza, oh, and I, I wish I had hung out with him a little more. He was he very was, nice. Yeah, he was a big sweetheart. He was great, and he loved. And he even played that night. Really. And we should have stayed. You see, I don't... With Monster Palooza, Sunday night, there's always an after party. But I never go to it because I've spent the whole day in that place. Yeah, right. And when it's, when it's over, I want to go somewhere else. But I should have stayed for that because uh, he did play. And he's Tina Turner's sax player, so he's, like, sure really good. I remember I saw What's Love Got to Do, and I was like, holy shit, it's the dude from Lost Boys. Oh, well, have you seen <laughs> the, the music video uh, Only the Living? No. Look it up on YouTube, dude. Only the living. All Only right, the living. I'll put it on my page for you because it's a hot song. Hot. And she's like, she's totally, I mean, it's, she's at, she's Tina at her, her peak. Right. She's Tina at the time of Thunderdome. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Because all the music videos, but he's in those too. He's in uh, uh, Only the Living is from Thunderdome. Oh, okay. That would make sense then. And he's the he's the her main dude in that. He's actually in the Lost Boys sequel. There's just a shot of, of him, him on the. I yeah, saw yeah, that. and I was like, oh come on, are you serious? Like that's what you're giving him? Um, but yeah, but yeah, he was he was very nice. I was very happy to meet him. He did you ever meet Corey Hames? No, I've never met the the Corys. Well, I met Corey Hames at a autograph show towards the end of his life. And it was just very strange because he was obviously disoriented. He was obviously high, I think, at some point. And uh, it was just really disturbing. And uh, I think he was, he was just manipulated by so many people. The other Corey Feldman, you know, I, I, I've been around him a couple of times, but I don't really know. I just think there's something going on there that, that – the charm and the fun of the first movie, that's the way I want to remember it. Those Frog Brothers sequels are decidedly awful. And the one where Corey comes back and then's cut out of it and there's a whole drama in there. Right. Where at the end of it, they're sitting at a lamp. They're sitting on a park bench. And it's just like, the, it's, it's not even a movie anymore. It's just like, we're filming reality here. Right. Did, David, have you ever read the script, The Lost Girls, the original 
Lost Boys sequel. No. It's solid. And I, it was a shame because that was, I don't know when it was written, but it was much closer after the original Lost Boys came out. And it's about female vampires. Yeah, but it, it still has the central characters from the Lost Boys. And like all the actors were alive that could have been involved. And it was a, a huge missed opportunity. Um, I think so. I, I think I read it in like 1990. But you know what makes the original Lost Boys so good and why all the sequels are just pointless is that you you have to have that kind of a cast. You cannot do the sequels with a lot of direct-to-video people. You don't have Diane Weist coming back. You don't have Edward Herman coming back. You don't even have Kiefer Sutherland coming back. Right. And without Kiefer, you don't have a... I mean, he, to me, was... His relationship with Jason Patrick is the... is what that movie resonated to everyone that saw it because it was uh it was edgy the music was amazing and it was there were just a lot of things going on there and joel shoemaker has made some very interesting movies for a man that everyone kind of took rather frivolously at because after all he was a set designer his first movie was the incredible shrinking woman with lily tomlin which was a movie that was more color coordinated than it was directed. And then of course he never lived down the Batman he did, which <laughs> was gorgeous. I mean, the set design in that was, but you, you know, it's, right, right. but, but I think that falling down is a great, movie. yeah, that's, that's a great movie. falling down is a great movie. And uh phone booth is a great movie. Yeah. I enjoyed, phone I think booth. Larry Cohen wrote uh phone booth. He, uh, Schumacher, did a movie called Blood Creek that I really liked. Have you seen that? No, is that, that new? That has Michael Fassbender in it. It's like 2000, I don't know, seven, eight, nine. It's it's a unique horror movie. It, it, it it's deals called with Blood Creek? Blood Creek, yeah, and it deals with like uh, Nazi occultism, but in West Virginia. Really? But it's, it's a cool movie, yeah. There's, I've never even heard of it. Wow. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you a trailer for it or something. But track it down. It's fun. Well, I will. I will. Well, now, with uh, as far as franchise movies goes, I mean, what do you think of Salem's Lot? Uh, have you seen the second version with Rob Lowe? I have not seen the Rob Lowe version. I remember uh, as a little kid, you probably have this and maybe you figured these out, where you just have a memory burned into your head and you don't know what movie it was. And at some point in time, I figured out I had this memory of some vampire getting impaled with an American flag and a bunch of vampires on a bus. And I figured out that was Salem's Lot too. And so I rewatched that as an adult and it definitely was not nearly as awesome as I remember that as a No. <laughs> and, and I had the same experience with it. But I saw it at Warner Brothers where they put both – parts one and two together and i was with reggie nalder and david soul was sitting behind us with a six pack of beer between his legs and uh we had like a picnic all our food was put in those like napkins and put on sticks like we were tom sawyer so they tried to play up the salem's lot being rural and uh it was scary when reggie first pops his head up in the jail cell when that uh boyfriend is in jail that got a scare and uh the stuff when uh he breaks into lance kerwin's house and kills his parents and then mason comes in that confrontation with mason everyone always remember back shaman you between you and the master put down your cross right and people remember that but for the whole it's decidedly a tv movie of the week uh, this the this the Rob Lowe version is a little better in many ways. Really? Although the 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 Barlow is not as much fun because it's Rutger Hour and it's yeah, not yeah. it's not a Nosferatu makeup. I see, I see. Uh, but see, once again, they they play around with it. The thing in both of them, the thing that everyone remembers is Danny Glick at the window. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean that and that. See anything? The thing I think that was hardest for American horror movies to do was to make monsters out of children. Hmm. One of the things they cut out of Dracula all the time is the scene early on when the woman goes to the castle, the, the peasant woman, and screams, Br Monster, bring me back my child. Because Dracula has put a child in a, in a little briefcase, in a little valise, and takes it to the brides. Because when they want to do something with Jonathan Harker, he goes, Back, I brought something for you. And in several versions, the two things in Dracula they rarely show is him 
climbing down the wall of his castle like a lizard and the eating of the baby by the three brides. And there's only maybe the Coppola version has it and uh, the Louis Jordan version has it and the Jess Franco version has it. Dracula with Lugosi doesn't because you wouldn't dare with children. But uh, think about it. I mean, that's what makes Lost Boys so good. They're not children, they're teenagers, but and they're a little older than that, really. But uh, it's really, I mean, that's why when I did, uh, I did a thing for one of the DVDs of Grizzly, and I thought, here's a movie that's shot like a TV movie of the week, but early into it, a little kid is dismembered by a grizzly, and I'm a, what? You see like a little arm flying off to the left, and when, when did this, how did that get, how did that get greenlit? Right. Because if you think about it, children rarely get... Get theirs. Yeah. Of course, well, that's changing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean... Um, the witch a baby is sacrificed. Right. Well, what about... So, I mentioned Night of the Living Dead being a black and white movie. Well, and that has the most right. famous murder of a child by its... Uh, the mother by its child. That right, was one of the... Mo- that was like... And that's in Psycho. But... After that, I was like, okay, black and white horror movies can be great. And I remember seeing The Bad Seed, and that also like pulled me in. Granted, that's like an evil kid. Very evil. How, what was the reaction of the public to being like, oh my God, there's a little... The Bad Seed caused such a reaction on Broadway that when it was on stage for the curtain call, the girl would come out and there was a chair in the center of the stage and each cast member would sit in the chair... Rhoda would come out and each one of them would spank the shit out of her. (laughs) And the audience was like, yay. And so the mother came out and packed her. And then the guy that she burns up, Henry Jones, he comes. They had to do that because they couldn't leave it alone. Now in the movie, she's killed by the will of God. She's electrocuted by lightning when she goes back to get that damn medal, when she right, brings right, that... Right, right, right. But the, the woman I love in the black seat is Eileen Eckert, the drunken mother. She says, you take my drink away. Somebody took my drink away. Rhoda, Rhoda, honey, you know, do you remember my little boy? Yeah, but Nancy Kelly gives a performance in that that's just... She's hysterical through the whole movie. That's an amazing performance. Yeah, it was a great movie. I mean, it... But see, Evil Children, Village of the Damned and Children of the Damned are both... The Children of the Damned are really... No one ever talks about that movie anymore. And there was a Spanish movie called Who Could Harm a Child? Who Could Kill a Child. Who Could Kill a yeah, Child. That was great. That I, well, was, I, I can't say that. I've only seen the remake of that. And I loved the remake. I well, the original's good, too. That's that's what I've heard. But because I think I really like the remake because I've not seen the original. Yeah. And it's fairly pretty Well, now, speaking of remakes, I just gave you a copy of Curse of the Demon, Night of the Demon. And that was also a, an M.R. James short story called Casting the Runes, which is immortalized in Rocky Horror. You know, they, Dana Andrews said prunes gave him the runes because that's a line from Night, as you'll see when you watch okay, Curse right. of the Demon. But that could be remade now. And I think it's considering that we have a demon from hell, well, can you imagine? We could actually see that now. But see, the problem is, I would like someone like the late Alan Rickman to play the sorcerer. There's a renewed interest in witchcraft, which I find. Well, do you think that that's uh, kind of an interesting thing, that witches are now... Uh, well... I mean, it's like with zombies had a run. and now, the, but see, Witches seem to be... The witch thing might be due to the Me Too movement... I don't know if that's like... Feminist. I'm sure it's part of it. it you know, I, I don't think it was initially, but then I think people like looked at that and it's like, okay, yeah, we can run with this. So that that would not surprise me if we're seeing a bunch of witch movies. Um, you had touched on clown movies. Well, and they're remaking The Craft. I right, think. yeah, there you go. I that's, mean, The Craft is... Because it's all Sabrina, Buffy... It's all about teenage witches. It's all about, it's, it's you know, hell mouth is in your college. It's in your, you know, it's all, we've done it all. Right. So I don't know what's going to be new. I'm amazed that there's as much imagination as I've seen. I mean, it's all on cable TV. Yeah, there's. I just see so much. In fact, there's so many shows that I've not heard of that it's just, you have, I don't, it's enough time to watch all of it. And I don't have all the cable channels to get it all either. So right, it's really hard to stay on top of. You, you can't almost. There's, it's overwhelming. There's too, there's many, too much. 
Right. So what does that mean for us when there's too much information, too much visual things to look at? What does one do? You have to be select. I mean, what would be your suggestion for someone that was trying to like get into watching uh, horror as it is today? I mean, what would you suggest as like the first five things they should watch if somebody likes wants to? That doesn't know anything about that maybe the genre. doesn't or is like attracted to it and doesn't know why. Maybe I mean maybe pick a, a one from each different decade. That's a good idea. That, that kind of like is pretty informative, and then, you know, there's obviously a couple things you could choose from. Like I, you know, is it right to say, hey, watch? I don't know for the '80s, Lost Boys. Maybe, but The Lost Boys isn't really a scary movie, so maybe... But I, you see, my whole... That's what we were talking about before we started doing this podcast, was like, what really scares you? I it, it, for, I don't know about you, but it's been a long time since a horror movie, really. I mean, I don't think I go into a horror movie to be scared so much as I just want the imaginative, the kind of suspending belief for two hours and going into a different world. It doesn't necessarily have to frighten me. It right. can disturb me. I, I, I'm more disturbed by things, especially movies that deal with serial killers, because serial killers are a real, they're yeah, not right, make-believe. Right, right. And I think a lot of people are fascinated with serial killers. Zac Efron's just done a new movie on Ted Bundy. And once again, the internet like was going crazy because people were having to go, look, women, quit glamorizing Ted Bundy. Oh, he's hot. No, he's not hot. There's nothing hot about him. They don't know what he did. This guy cut off heads and, and filleted them. This guy had sex with decomposing corpses. This was not some hot dude that was just strangling women and leaving them by trees. This was a monster, a monster in, in a human form. And Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, another monster. These were not, you know, there's uh, the ones, it's just funny, because of Dexter, and maybe even if we go back to Hannibal, if a serial killer is attractive, you kind of root for him. Right. What do you think about that, where one's physical appearance completely redefines how you judge them? It's... Why it's, women would want to go to bed with Ted Bundy or the Menendez brothers or Charlie Manson. All these serial killers get get conjugal rights with just... I mean, they get laid more in jail than people that aren't. <laughs> I don't know. It's attraction is a strange thing. It is. You know, like it's your, your your sight is your dominant sense. And if something's appealing to you, you have to mentally make the distinction that like, okay, this is a terrible this person's terrible, they're evil, they're whatever, but then hey, they have sex appeal. Like there's not enough women serial killers to look at and be like, "Oh, she's she's beautiful." You know, is you'd be it would be intriguing. Like a, it'd be, well, it'd be like Mata Hari or somebody where you're a spy. Or, okay, but, right. but, but women, yeah. I mean, that's why when Hammer was running out of gas, they went for lesbian vampires. Because one thing about straight men, for some reason, ever since porn began, straight men have liked looking at two women getting it on. <laughs> but if you put two men in that situation, the horses leave the barn and everybody heads for the ocean. It's like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's two penises, get out of here. But I mean, I just always knew that when I was introduced to porno as a kid and I was watching straight porn and there was always a scene where two women would get all over each other, like, like our, our current first lady. And I'm like, uh, wow, I mean, men seem to like this, you know, two women, you know, getting right. all... Why do you think that is? Or is well, it just... with, with straight porn, I would say it's because guys, yeah, they want to see naked women doing it, sexual things. So it's like, oh, throw in two of them. Double, double, double. double. Right. In fact, they're getting off on each other really isn't the issue. Right. I mean, it's that that would be my. Well, I'll tell you, theory. when the L word first came out and I started watching episodes of that, I went, you know. I don't know. I got to tell you, there was some stuff there that I, I was really surprised. But then I didn't watch the whole scene. I mean, it's, what was it, 11 years of that show? Or? Jesus, I did not know that. So some of these shows, you, you think they're over and you go, oh, no, it's season number 20. Right. I mean, I didn't know Supernatural was as long as it, 15 years. When did that happen? Yeah, that's that's a long time. I mean, I mean True Blood came and went. Right. Uh, uh, Dexter, what was it, eight seasons of that? But some of the stuff with, uh, see, that went into serial killers to where you're watching every week. 
this guy get away with murder, but the reason it's okay is he's killing people that deserve it. Yeah, right, right. And Hannibal Lecter, the same thing. If the orchestra is not playing properly, I'll eat the person that's off key. And you're perfectly fine with it. I mean, oh, that's what, how charming. <laughs> it's subversive. I mean, I mean, beautiful people get away with murder. But I think the Ted Bundy thing is really, which is why I think it's interesting that Zac Efron has done this for his career, because he's really a good actor on top of being really good looking. So, and they're calling this like really wicked and vile. The name of the, of the show is like, and they're trying to show him because he has like a wife during this whole thing where he's out murdering all these people. And how does she come to terms? Because she didn't know. Right. Did you see the, the Bundy series on Netflix? Yes. What did you think of that? Well, it was very disturbing. But yeah. also, it's played up in his favor, which is kind of weird. What do you, what do you mean? Well, I that? mean, it's like he's, he's accountable for what he does, but he doesn't seem to be... He doesn't look at it the way because he's insane. Right, yeah, that's certainly true. It was it was pretty unnerving because I didn't know that much about him, you know, I knew the, You didn't realize what drugs. a monster he was. Right, and how he went about it and just like just hearing his voice and how he would talk about it and dismiss certain things and you're just like Jesus Christ, that's insane. There's a series I was watching that was showing the origins of the FBI and how they started profiling serial killers. Right, it's a uh, What's his name? I cannot. From uh, Fight Club. What? Not Edward. David no. Fincher. David Fincher. Yeah. Yes. That was his show. It's right. a good show. I said, I watched the pilot and then I think I got distracted and completely forgot about that show. But you really shoot. should stay with it because he goes to Manson. He goes, but the one guy he goes to and the actor is just like he's a big baby Huey type guy like Victor Buono and baby Jane. And he talks about all the women he murdered. He murdered his own mother and cut her head off and had sex with it and stuff. And this is all real. That, I think, was actually in the pilot. Like, I, that rings a bell. It was. And when you, because you're watching this reenactment and you have to keep telling yourself, this is not fantasy. This is, this guy right. did this. And now he's sitting there, would you like a tuna sandwich? It's just, I think the one thing about, see, horror movies give you an opportunity to do things that you normally wouldn't do. But I think what's kind of spilt over into the way the culture relates to horror now is there are so many movies that we've been discussing, like The House that Jack built or Dexter, and everything, where they're based on the reality. And it all goes back to Jack the Ripper, the, the granddaddy of all serial killers, who really didn't kill that many people. How many people did Six. he kill? Six. That's nothing. But compared. because they never found him, it was terrible. Well, and because it was done, it was, it was very, uh, it, it kept all the dramatic tropes of the mystery thriller, the Edgar Wallace thriller. You have London in the fog in the 1890s yeah, under right. Victoria, okay. and there's street walkers, and it's Whitechapel, and everybody's in top hats and capes. And it just lent itself to the romanticism of the Victorian era. And, and, you know, in the big, if you've seen the countless movies, you know what's fascinating to me? I can name five movies about Jack the Ripper. I can't name but maybe even one or two about Lizzie Borden. And Lizzie Borden's story is so Americana. And it's about a, a definite lesbian who murdered her parents, her stepmother and father, for the money. And also because he was molesting her. And no one knew this at the time. And I find her trial and everything about it fascinating. Is do you know that she was on morphine during that whole thing? No. During that, that whole trial, they said she's upset. Let's give her something. It's a murder trial, and you're stoned on morphine. She goes in there, the, and the people looking at her go, "She looks so calm, like she did, couldn't possibly have done it." Well, uh, yeah, if you're on morphine, you're going to kind of forget you hacked your evil father up into it. So that, did that play a role in like how people perceived her during the trial? Yes. Of really, course it really. did. Of uh, course it did. Of course it did. But then there again, justice is blind. And, that's de and she stayed in that town, lived up above it, even though the people loathed her. And her sister moved away. I think her sister moving, and they died a week apart. I think her sister moving away was definitely letting you know she was guilty because there's no way she didn't do it was she, was she considered a serial killer or did she just do some heinous shit she just killed her parents right, right. she didn't kill anyone else or she wouldn't have see so she was not a serial killer but 
the fact she killed her own father. And that was the way it was done. Right. And of course, in a small town like that, I mean, do you know that that, that, that bed and breakfast, that, that the place where the parents were murdered is now a hotel you can stay in? No, but that does not surprise me. In I want to go. I mean, they would have keychains or little hatchets. I mean, they've done it. It's a total s- tourist. Well, it's like if you go to Salem, Massachusetts. They play up the fact oh, that yes. it's the witch capital of the world. Right. Why wouldn't they? But- well, why wouldn't they? But, I mean, if one really if one really studies the history of witchcraft and Cotton Mather and all of that, you know, all of these poor women were set on fire for no reason other than the ignorance and stupidity of the the era and people in which they lived. But all horror movies, especially, and I take the Children of the Corn franchise for a minute, and The Wicker Man, and all the paganism, that that's kind of an untapped. Because, you know, like The Wicker Man, The Green Man, Children of the Corn, it all kind of takes, and I don't want to say like Mormons, but it does take that certain kind of religious, uh, like the... Uh, uh, what was the movie where the, the Amish, you know, people that move away from society and form some kind of ancient, well, it's like what Shall, M. Knight did with the village, you know, trying to make it uh, uh, some kind of, and it all goes back to old religions. So I, I don't know. I mean, I just think that there's all kinds of great stories out there that have not been told. So it disturbs me that we live as right now as going into 2020 in an era where more and more movies are all about things that we're seeing again and again and again. Yeah. I mean, but you also have to consider who's, if it's like a big studio, they're want to know what's going to sell. What's a sure bet. Well, what do you do when something like us or get out makes a fortune and you want to make more movies like that? Is there a market for more like racially charged horror movies like that? Or have they, I mean, can you, what can you possibly say having said that? Right. Um, I mean, I, th- I think they look at, at Peel and they're just like, okay, we trust him. He can do whatever the fuck he wants. And yeah. it'll be... It'll well, they did that with M. Night. And then it <laughs> took a long time for him to come back and... Yeah, I mean... But yeah, I mean, there, there's always new things to say and explore, but it's everything's a risk, right? And so that's where they want to hedge their bets. Well, it is a risk, but uh, I look at what makes money. That's what surprises me. It's surprising what does make money because sometimes the critics, it doesn't matter what you write about a movie. People will go see it anyway. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example that's a horror movie. I know that when The Great Showman came out with Hugh Jackman and Zac Efron and that, the critics hated it. I went to see it at the arc light and there were four girls behind me. That was the fourth time they'd come to see it. It was a cult movie. And I realized watching it, I said, this movie will, someone will be watching it till the end of time now because it's an empowering movie. It's got a nice energy to it. And I think people like that. I think that's why those Mamma Mia movies as unwatchable as they can be, (laughs) and they are unwatchable, but I know too many people that watch them, including myself. I remember going in to see the second one, which I swore I wasn't going to do, but circumstance, I wound up going with a friend of mine. And as it was starting, he looked over at me and he said, you know, I don't know if I can sit through this. It's just too fucking nice. (laughs) And I realized that this movie did not have one malevolent thing in it. And you just had to adjust to it because it's like, am I going to sit through all this happiness for two hours? And then you stop and realize, why can't I look at something happy and not feel guilty about it? Because I refuse to go see the new Mary Poppins movie because I thought it's going to be just too much of an overload of saccharin. And I definitely feel that way about Dumbo for a number of reasons. Because I, when I was a little boy, you know the movie that frightened me when I was little was Bambi and Dumbo. Those two movies I saw when I was very young, and the fact that the mothers die in it, I found just horrifying. horrifying. I couldn't deal with it. And to this day, my Irish friend last week, we went by the El Capitan Theater where they're playing the Tim Burton Dumbo. And he said, come on in, let's go see it. No, 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 no. Not going to see it ever. Because I just can't see movies where animals, because Dumbo by just, I don't care. It's just so cute. 
and Bambi too, right? You don't take their mommies away. Come on. I have a friend who was saying that about Dumbo that she's like, I, that movie you know, mortified her. So she's like, I kind of want to see the new one, but this, I don't think I can do it. I can see Lady and the Tramp because nothing, no one gets killed in that. One of the dogs gets hurt when Tramp gets caught in the, when they're trying to pick all the stray dogs up. I remember this because see, I saw those movies when I was like five and six years old. Yeah, right. See, that is when, and I say this to anyone listening about your taste in movies, whatever you watch, whatever age you are, when you watch movies from like the first year of your life till the 12th year of your life, everything that you visually, uh, that stimulates you is going to stay with you forever. So it's what I call beyond criticism. When someone says to me, why do you like Dracula? Well, okay. When you look at Dracula today, it's very old fashioned. It's a snooze fest. When they leave Transylvania, it's basically a photograph stage play. So it's not all that exciting. But when you're five years old or six years old, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. And you just, and that's what you remember. I think people expect these movies to get more modern the older you get. And it doesn't work that way. No, not at all. You know, the movies are what they are. You just keep going back to it. You're the one that's changing. Yeah. When right. I think back to when I first started watching, like, The Black Cat, it was, like, seven, six years old. And then I'm watching it now as I'm 100, and I'm still getting, like, uh, you know, I see different things in it. You know, we're watching a lot. of. I mean, a lot of movies went over my head when I was little. I didn't know what I was watching. You know, you go and look at a movie like... Um, I was watching The Uninvited, that ghost story from the 40s with uh, Ray Milland. Well, there's a whole subtext, a whole lesbian subtext between a woman that runs a girl's school and the ghost of one of the women in the movie. I, would, I didn't pick any of that up when I was a kid. <laughs> Lesbians? I Certainly not. But it's there. But you just have to be old enough to... Be able to catch that. Yeah. Right. So, so what I'm saying about this is that sometimes you need to revisit a movie just to get the full impact of it now that you're... But sometimes that can be a two-edged sword. I mean, you were just telling me in the car you hadn't seen a movie in a long time when you watched it again. Eh, why yeah. did I like it so much in the first place? I think it was probably visually stimulating, and I hadn't seen that at such a young age, you know? That's like, well, and, and of course you hadn't seen as many movies. Right. The right. more movies you see, the more... You see, we're jaded now. I mean, we've seen everything. This cat's just seen Pet Cemetery. Yeah, that's Cleo. She's got a chronic, chronic cold, which is unfortunate because she's always like sniffing. Did you see all the different cats that were used in the new one? They had like them up on those little uh, little chairs that say Pet Cemetery. Yeah, I saw I saw pictures, and the directors were talking about that how they had like eight different cats playing church. And uh, one to like stare, one to hiss. One well, the to one jump. that had the hair all matted. Well, I will say one thing about the remake and the original. The the actor who plays the the old fellow, the neighbor, is brilliant in both movies. I mean, Fred right, Gwynn yeah. is perfect, and John Lithgow is perfect. They are perfect. And but on uh, having said that, I don't know that if I had to justify remaking it. I don't know if I could justify it in a way that would make total sense. It's, yeah, I mean, the, the, I I don't know. This ties into, like, something that I think is always an effective scare in a horror movie is uh, when, when I heard they were remaking Pet Cemetery years ago, and I think I told you this, that uh, George Clooney was rumored to play uh, I didn't know Lewis. That. Um it, what didn't happen I was like no don't remake this movie because I found Zelda from the original one of the scariest things I'd ever seen like, that burned a hole in my memory and at that point I realized I'm like I could look at the shiny the woman in the room you look at the lady in black you can look at you know the little the twins like women as the, the ring right women as scary monsters really works for me and I'm not sure why I don't know if that's my own thing but I think it's a common Phenomenon. Do you remember House on Haunted Hill? I have only Do you remember Mrs. Slides, the creepy old hag that comes into this? She scares the shit out of this woman. She's in a black, darkened basement, and all of a sudden the music's all scary. And they've got this elderly lady with her eyes glazed over and her hair all wild and fat. So she looks like kind of a, a, a witch. She's on a, a, a board that's rolling by itself, and she just comes into the frame 
And it's so, and if you think about it, uh, I, I can think of another couple of events. Well, of course, the classic Mrs. Bates and Psycho. Right. Uh, but there are a lot, and you know, I'm doing a podcast uh, for my, our friend Rebecca on uh, Psycho Biddy Hagsploitation, which of course is the history of the, the scary old scary old lady in movies that goes all the way back to Gloria Swanson and Sunset Boulevard B- prior to that all the way to film noir where women are like femme fatales right right uh, and then the psycho biddies that came after baby Jane yeah no it's a real thing I, I, I mean as a kid I always like it's not scary now to me but uh Lady in White, you had the Lady in White, and she was creepy until, yes. until it's revealed who she is. You know, she like, is. But she, because, and that's the way Frank Laloja put that together. Frank lives in Rome now, but I remember Lady in White, I liked a lot. And yeah. And Fear No Evil, his earlier movies, very. That's nice. a fun one. That has a really interesting sound. That is too. very, because it's about the devil coming of age. And that was made at a time when, and Frank's a lapsed Catholic. And, uh, you know, that movie, because I, I knew him quite well when he lived here and he moved away. It's a shame because those two movies are really good. And it's, I really wish he'd made another. Yeah. So Lady in White was amazing. Like, that's a really, really good movie. I wish I had those Bela masks the little kid wears. You know that, the Dracula mask? Yeah, I've never I seen one in a store. It looked like a little Lugosi mask. Yeah, yeah, I remember. But I had that on VHS not too long ago. What are your favorite ghost stories besides, I mean, do you like, you like like the old fashioned ghost story in a haunted house or you like it where ghosts appear in the most unlikely places? I, I mean, it, I really like the ring. That's a remake. I liked more than the original. Like I, I wasn't that into ring you, but I thought the well, that's a real better. creepy image coming out of that TV. Yeah. Um, I mean, I like vengeful ghosts. I think that's, you're taking something that's kind of, creepy and making it worse which is which it is, goes back like to the haunting the legend of hell house uh, right uh, uh the, here's one for you that, well the amityville series is is because it's supposed to be based on a true something but i don't know having seen half of those things i don't think it's based on anything but, <laughs> you know i like the ryan reynolds one because it explains why the place is haunted which the other movies never do yeah i like the i like that remake actually that's not a bad remake. A lot of people don't talk about it. But I I, I'm with you. I, I enjoyed that one. Um, what, uh, a ghost story that I thought was kind of cool is, uh, I guess it's a ghost, is the entity. Yes. You don't see it, but it's still just like, wow. Well, you've got to give a lot of credit to Barbara Hershey. Yeah. And give her, it, cause yeah she, I think she, that's an Oscar-worthy performance. And, of course, because it's a horror movie, nobody gives her the credit they should. And I thought that same with the actress in Hereditary. I thought she should have definitely been. Nominated. Yeah, she's great. She was. She was also now. There's an actress that could be another horror. Well, she she was also in The Sixth Sense. That's so right. she she's done has a couple those big ones. Um, Tony Collette is her name, right? Yeah, she's. I feel like she's been in more than just those two movies. I'm trying. All right, I'll tell you the one Stephen King I walked out on at the Egyptian was Maximum Overdrive. <laughs> And that's just, I'm sorry. It's, I know some people think it's, some people really like it because it's so bad, like the right. apple or something, but I don't know. It's, I mean, it's, yeah, I liked it as a kid more than, than I do now. as an adult. I like the concept, you know, all these robots are. Did you see Howard crazy. the Duck? Yes. So what's your opinion on Howard the Duck? I, I haven't seen that since I was a kid, but Did you as like a kid, it? I liked it. I was like, oh, it's a duck and, you know, he's talking and it's funny and it's, it's Well, I'll tell you, there was a scene where Howard pulls his wallet out and he's got a condom in it. Right. He's I a duck. <laughs> Why would a duck... Never mind. Why would a duck have a condom? What do I know? Adult humor. If you name Howard the Duck, you can... And Howard the Dick, I could have got him. No, it's Howard the Duck. Wait a minute. That movie lost money, didn't it? Yeah. It, it didn't do too well. And was it the... No. Because you were in Messiah Evil. Yes. And the writers who wrote Messiah Evil also wrote Temple of Doom, and I feel like they wrote Howard the Duck as well. I bet they did. In fact, I'm sure they did. So... <laughs> well, you, my, my, you want to briefly tell you my little Messiah of Evil story. I was in college up at San Francisco State, and uh, there was a um, Warhol lady that was doing a psychic... She had written a book on psychic something or other, and she was doing tarot card reading. Ultraviolet was her name. Or ultraviolet or 
international velvet. It was one of those ladies. I've forgotten which one it was. But I went to this book signing in North Beach, and this woman said they're shooting a zombie movie down at Point Dune called Messiah. I think it was called Messiah Beeble then. You guys, if you drive down there, you could be extras. So we did. We, it was a weekend. We drove down there and we became extras in this movie. They painted us green because when the blood moon comes out on the beach, all those people are like green face zombies. You can't really tell that when the zombies are in the theater. I'm not, my scene, I'm the guy when they're at the filling station. Right, right. I'm, I'm the guy that, that jumps out of the car. That's my scene. And Your face is painted white. Yeah, yeah. And that, and then I did some stuff on the beach. That was my two days in there. And I met this actress named Joy Bang. What a name, Joy Bang. She was like a, a stripper actress type, and you know, she was kind of funny. But I just, I, have, I just remember that, and I never thought that movie would get released. Well, I, that was a movie I didn't hear about till a couple of years ago, and it's like even if I haven't it's seen a great every horror movie, movie, I'm like. I know of them, and someone's like mentioned. I'm like, I've never heard of this. And then I think it was on Amazon Prime. And then I was like, Dan, or to, to our friend Dan, I was like, you guys see this. So then he he saw it and enjoyed it as well. So yeah, if you haven't seen Messiah Evil, you should. Check well, it. and the music in that is very bizarre. Yeah, it's it is a bizarre. And there's an actor in it from Something Wicked This Way Comes. Who? The old man. That's uh, uh, the guy, the lightning rod salesman. Really, he's. That's huh. the same actor. Wow, it? It was Royal Dano. Royal Dano. I didn't put that together. The the uh, the scenes that stand out the most to me, Messiah Evil, are the supermarket scene and the movie theater scene. Oh, that's the like, guy eating the mouse in the pickup truck is kind of that, unforgettable. That yeah. guy looks so weird. Yeah, there's, I remember him. He was weird anyway. <laughs> Just a weird guy. But, but there was something decidedly Lovecraftian about that because of the, the, the weird creature that comes during the blood moon. And they used a little of that in... Uh, there's this director that I would like to recommend to people that worked with Dario Argento. He did two movies, The Sect and The Church. Oh, yeah, I've Michel seen The Church. Michele Suave. He Michele was... Suave. He also did Stage Fright. Yes. And he was in Demons. He's a guy yes. who's handing out the tickets, yeah. He's incredible. I think he's very talented. I like those movies. Oh, yeah. They've yeah. got incredible energy in them. And the visually, the church has more going on. It's, it's just uh, an amazing... Yeah. The, I like Stage Fright, too. For, so did I. I like the stage, stage Fright. But he, well he his son got ill and he quit making movies. Maybe I heard that. I can't remember. The weird thing about the church, though, is that was supposed to be Demons 3... And well, it has kinda, enough, well, it does have a demon in it. But, but it's it's not the same no. thing. But it's still a great movie if you, if you like the other two. Oh, I know. I, if you like the, if you like uh, Suspiria and that kind of thing, I think you'll like. And Argento is the producer. But this kid, the, this guy that directed these movies, I think The Sept with Herbert Long, what a movie. And it just does, takes you places. You starts with kind of a Manson-like killing and then takes you into Germany and into mysticism and the, the real meaning of Easter and paganism. And it's just wild. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll check Now, the out. demons you're talking about, I, I don't have those anymore because Blue Underground, when I first started doing DVD supplements, I was doing laser discs. I was doing image entertainment laser discs in Chatsworth. And I was writing the copy and providing the photographs. Then we move over to the beginnings of DVD. Demons 1 and 2 were like a double... Thing that came out from uh, Anchor Bay and since then I've lost track of how many times they've come out on Blu-ray and everything else but I don't have them anymore I should get them they're they're a lot of fun do you like the uh, Lucio Fulci movies or are you kind of like because see I'm not as big a fan of his as I am his movies, movies are more like watching a dream or some weird abstract it has really cool visuals but the story isn't what you watch those movies for you know no because um, there isn't one for the most part. There was a movie, We're Still Here, that came out not too long ago. I think Barbara Crompton is in it. Yes. That was Larry Fez. Yeah, he, he's in it. And that looked like a Fulci movie, but it had more of a stronger story structure than I, I well, enjoyed. Well, but it wasn't, it wasn't as good as it could have been. I don't think. 
What what would you have? Where would you I don't know. I think when all the people come up, isn't that the one at the end that they're all in the house and they're all like black charred black eyes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Barbara Crimp, Lisa Marie was in that. I was at the uh, I was at an opening of that with Lisa and and Larry. Larry wasn't here. Larry wasn't here. Larry came into town for something else and came to the jump cut. Oh, really? Yeah. Did he do a round? Yeah. <coughs> and we showed Habit. He had a 16 millimeter print of Habit, so we looked at that. That's a good movie. Yeah, that's a cool. Uh, that's a really cool vampire movie at a time when I didn't think you could make a cool vampire movie in New York City on no money. Right. Yeah, it's a very like low budget movie. Very low, but it's really crazy. See, you. That's what I want to see more of in our horror 101 crowd is that kind of imagination. You don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to have big stars, but you've got to have imagination and be able to. Do you realize that we live right here in Hollywood? There's some amazing places to shoot movies here. Yeah. People rarely do. Or if they do, they, you know, tend to go to just the same old places. But there's abandoned cemeteries around here. There's mountainous areas. There's the ocean. There's the mountains. There's Joshua Tree. There's Palm Springs. There's all kinds of places to, you know. That's a very good point, David. Um, something else I want to touch on, I know we've been going at it for a while, is your relationship with Vincent Price. Like, I think a lot of people would be fascinated by that. Well, I'm very lucky in that I was a huge Vincent Price fan growing up, and I was living in Sacramento, California. And in 1967, Vincent Price came to Sacramento to do a one-man show called Dear Theo, where he read the letters between Vincent van Gogh and his brother Theo, because he was so interested in painting and art history. I was not particularly interested in painting and art history at that time, <laughs> but I was very interested in Vincent Price. So I went down to see, see the show, and when it was over, I went backstage, and uh, I was still in high school. And I remember I walked up to him and I said, Mr. Price, I'm a writer with the Tomahawk and Encina High School. And I would like to do an interview with you. And he looked around at me and he said, the Tomahawk, what high school? Encina High School. Well, 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 we better sit over here and get ready for this interview. And he was like, and here I am in some bullshit newspaper in some high school. Couldn't have been nicer to me. Gave me his home address and stuff. That was 1967. And I knew him until he died. That's... He stayed in touch with me until he died. And part of it was that through circumstance and luck, I moved from Sacramento to Los Angeles after college. But Vincent Price is one of those guys that, you know, sometimes you meet actors that you admire and they're very disappointing or they're, they don't have time for their fans or anything. This guy, Vincent Price, would if he was eating a meal and someone would come up and start talking to him, he'd let his meal go cold because that was the way he was. Whereas somebody like Cary Grant, if you went up to interview, to talk to him when he's eating, he'd get rid of you. So, you know, not everybody is like warm and fuzzy right, when right, it comes right. to that. But no, he was everything you would expect him to be and more. And he really loved his fans and he loved making movies. And he, I've never known anyone that had such a great time living. You went on a Vincent Price set, it was fun. If he wasn't having fun, he just wasn't there. I mean, he was there to do movies. He was there to make money, but he was there to have a good time. And he tried to be nice to everybody that was in his circle of, of you know, I mean, uh, I'll tell you who else was like that in a way was Christopher Lee. Although the difference between Christopher Lee and Vincent was Christopher was far shyer. He was a very shy man. So when he got around a lot of people, he would get very stuffy and very full of himself, which made people dislike him. Whereas Vincent was just the opposite. Everybody liked him, except Charles Bronson. What? For some reason, Charles Bronson was the one actor Vincent Price could never make friends with, and they made two pictures together. The very beginning of Charles Bronson's career was in House of Wax, using his real name of Charles Buczynski, and then in Master of the World, a few years later, he's Charles Bronson. And Vincent said he would not warm up to me he kept to himself. Later on, uh, Bronson said, I was very intimidated by being around people whose English was so much, because I'm a Polish coal miner. I don't know anything. 
I see. But I don't know that. I think from my experience with Charles Bronson working at Canon Films, he had an enormous ego. You did. You do not <laughs> fuck with Charles Bronson, man. When he would call Canon, he would like people weren't right on the ball. Do you know who I am? And he wore black silk pajamas, I know. But I liked him. I, I mean, you know what? He's someone that now, I wish I had had the respect for him now, then, when I was working where I could have met him and been around him. Right. Because now I really appreciate the Death Wish movies, and I think they're real fun. But at the time, he was making so many movies, and he and Chuck Norris and Jean-Claude Van Damme and Steven Seagal... And Mar Michael Dudikoff, they were all these, and, we, and I was a script reader, so all I was meant to do was find scripts for these people and put them in different piles after I'd read them. This is a Chuck Bronson, this is a Chuck Norris. And they were all, frankly, the same movie. <laughs> right. The only ones I would always give, the, the more exotic ones I would, I would put over for Jean-Claude. Because Jean-Claude, I really liked him. And I, I still do. I think he's a really fun... I, he was a really fun guy. And what I liked about him, too, is my height. Because I'm a short guy. And Jean-Claude short. And the muscles from Brussels. And, you know... Uh, I didn't know... Steven Seagal was a horrible man. Is a horrible man. He, I don't really know. I'm kind of confused now if he did work a lot at Canon. I know he did some Canon movies. But, you know, you have to realize Canon films in the short time... They were a studio here in Hollywood. They did over 300 movies. Yeah, I've seen the documentary in your feature. I'm in that. Yeah, I'm, I'm the documentary I am most remembered for at this moment is Electric Boogaloo by Mark Hartley. Do check it out because it's really good. He interviewed over 200 celebrities, everybody from Sharon Stone to Bo Derek. I don't know if Chuck Norris got in that because in the middle of what Mark was doing, Menachem Golan and, and Yoram Goblis, they decided to do their own documentary. Really? <laughs> and their documentary came out a month before Marx, and Marx started first. That's how fast they wow. turned it around. But either way, I think Marx is more... You're not going to get a, you know, warts and all documentary out of the Go-Go Boys. Yeah, right. But I enjoyed... Listen, I enjoyed working there. I thought... Menachem was a, a, a wonderful guy to talk to. Uh, he loved movies. I think anyone that loves movies deserves to live in Hollywood and, and be part of the of the scene here. I mean, that's really all we ask of people here is that they respect the movie industry and that they like the fact that we're in a really amazing place right now. I mean, it's got its drawbacks. It's you know, you got crazy people on the street, Hollywood's this and that. But it's changing. You need to come out to Hollywood now before it changes anymore. With with Canon Films, did you, when you said you were a reader, did you give them the kind of like, okay, make this movie, or were you just what, like... No, what a reader does, you're given a script, you condense that script into a paragraph. Right. right. That's where you That's where you earn your money. You, you take a 90-page script and turn it into a couple of paragraphs. And also, who would it be best suited for of the people that are that are their, their under-contract stars. So were you kind of like a casting agent? You're like, no, okay, these no. are the actors we have, and this is... No, who. no. What, I, what, what they would do, they, Chris Pierce was in charge of scripts. The scripts would come into canon. They would give them to readers like us to condense into a storyline. that. So, no, so, so all they had to do was read, read that. that. Right, yeah. But the only thing I did that would influence in any way is I would say this is for Charles Bronson. This is for Chuck Norris, because that's what they were looking for. They were not a studio looking for an amazing story and then cast it. They were looking for product that would go with the product they had. And then they would get like a franchise. They got the Superman franchise and just ran it into the <laughs> They destroyed right. that franchise for years. Just But Chris Reeve got... Well, you know who got the benefit of, of Chris Reeve being at Canon was an actor named Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman did a movie that, that Chris produced and starred in called Street Smart. Street Smart is the introduction the, of, of Morgan Freeman, who played an evil street pimp. And I will tell you something, Morgan never played a villain again after that, and he got Oscar nominated. Wow, I've, I've not heard that story, and I don't know the movie, so I'll have to check that no, out. Street Smart, it's really good. And, and Morgan Freeman's on fire. And that, that's a canon movie? Yes. 
right. The two canon movies that, and I just did one for Twilight Time, I did the audio commentary for Runaway Train, which is John Voight and Eric Roberts. I've seen that. That's a good movie. Yeah, yeah. Barfly is canon. That's Faye Dunaway, Mickey Rourke. Right, I've seen Mickey's that as well. Amazing transformation from all that boxing that messed him up. Uh, what were the other ones? Um, the the canon movie that Ten I, to Midnight. Uh, yeah, I just actually watched. I, that. I, I did the That's commentary. Kind of a, I love Ten to Midnight. Ten to Midnight could not even be what, made today because this well, guy is stark naked. What, yes, what, I, Gene what Davis from Cruising. Why was he naked and ever so he didn't get blood on his clothes? Yes, that was the whole. <laughs> well, you know what? That is the reason that Lizzie Borden got away with murdering her parents. They could not figure out how Lizzie, because the within twenty minutes of the murder, Lizzie is sitting in the living room in her dress, which has not got one spot of blood on it. There's no way those two people, the blood would have been everywhere. What she did, she went into the basement and got naked. She confronted her father in the nude with a hatchet. And then she went back downstairs and, and showered, which is where their shower was, where the water, where they had the water for bathing. Washed all the blood off, took the axe handle and put it in where the toilet goes, where the debris went back then. For So the wow. murder weapon's gone, the blood is gone. She's sitting in a dress. Her hair is made up. She's in a cat. She's like, I don't know what happened. And for ages, they said, well, it must have been some stranger that happened by the house and saw an open door and went in. No. That's wild. And so that's where they took that from? Yeah. Because if you're going to murder some, and now we can take that right to the O.J. Simpson murder. Nicole was, and now why is there no blood on him? Because he was wearing a frogman suit. You know, one of those rubber things. Oh, okay, right. And he got out of that, changed clothes. Cato Kalin remembers there's a knock at the end, because I, I know Cato, and he was, when I lived at Beverly and Oakhurst, Cato shopped at the Hughes Market there, and I, well, during the whole trial, I would see him, and it was like, he had to be, he was terrified. I do not doubt that, Jesus It was a terrifying thing for everybody, because that was such a brutal murder. But, you know, the public's fascination with it, the O.J. Simpson trial captivated this whole country. Yeah, oh, why not? I, you were living here then. I was. I was living right in Hollywood, and, uh, right in Beverly Hills. And, uh, yeah, it was like the rioting got as close to us as they closed the markets and stuff because they were rioting all the way into Beverly Hills. Jesus, I didn't know that. That's... It was bad. That and the Northridge earthquake were the two things I remember living through since I've lived in L.A. that were that were really rough. Because right. after the Northridge quake, I didn't want to live here anymore. Where were you? Were you I was living. Then? I was living on Beverly and Oakhurst. But my little apartment, I didn't have anyone up above me, so that place shook like a, like a, a matchstick, and, uh, and the aftershocks. You just it was just it was very disorienting. Uh, yeah. And there's nothing you can do. The best thing you can do is stay where you are. I laid in the bed when the apartment shook. It was like an exorcist movie. Make it stop! But I, I was not going to run out where, you know, the power lines are yeah, falling. Yeah, right, falling. Or, what, or you get in a door well. Right, yeah. If, in that. case, yeah, you know what I mean. But you, do you really, you don't, you're not thinking clearly. And it always happens early, early in the morning. Well, here's something kind of funny is being on the East Coast, the first earthquake I ever felt was in Virginia. And I was sitting in my car, and I had the engine on, and all of a sudden, the car starts shaking. But I thought it was someone just had their stereo cranked up, and it was the vibrations of that. And it, and it, but there was no music. So I was like, what the fuck? So I just totally dismissed it. Right. And later in the day, I found out, oh, we had an earthquake. And I was like, that's what a fucking earthquake felt like. Mm-hmm. It was It was like... Yeah, it's, it's really And the weird. thing you learn about it, which is why I dread another one, it's not the how, you know, like it was 6.5 or something. It's the duration of it. If you have a 6.5 earthquake in Los Angeles and it shakes for five minutes, everything's going to. That's why I don't understand why we're building tall anything here. Yeah, that's a good I mean, I, I have no, I see like on Sunset Boulevard where they're going to build this thing that overlaps onto the street that's hanging. Yeah. I just don't want to be there. Fortunately, I think most, most earthquakes uh, occur in the wee hours of the morning. So you're at home, you're in bed. 
Hopefully you're not in your car. Yeah, Jesus on love. I remember that earthquake up in San Francisco where a, a freeway fell onto it. So people were tra- people in the cars below were all crushed. That's just a horrible way to go. I mean, yeah, like, Jesus, that's that's a nightmare. But when I did the hundredth anniversary of Vincent Price, his centennial in in St. Louis, Missouri. I flew into St. Louis after they'd had this huge tornado there that tore off the roof of the of the airport and and flattened uh, Joplin. And I and that was the very week of that. And I flew in three days after Joplin got flattened, and St. Louis was already called Tornado Alley. Right. And I remember Vincent's daughter Victoria was there, and we were about to do a. A Q and A for the Whales of August, which is one of Vincent's last movies, and we did it. But she was driving. See, I flew in. She drove because she had heard about the tornado. She said, "I want to be able to get out of here in a moment's notice, and having a car is the only way to do that." I, on the other hand, was I had to go back to the airport, but we were okay. But the winds, and there would be like a an, a, an uh, it was weird to be in Vincent Price's hometown. <laughs> And right. the university where we showed the movies was across the street from where his family house was. And the clouds were all dark and it was thunder and storms. It was perfect. But we had very few people show up because everyone was afraid to leave their homes. Yeah, rightfully so. You know, but I mean, that was me going to the Vincent Price Centennial. And Roger Corman was there and Tim Lucas. But Tim came the day after I left. I didn't. I wanted to get back to California. I just... Because it was like they were still having them. Yeah, right. So I didn't want to stay there. But uh, no, I mean, I think we're, I think being in LA is the place to be right now. And, uh, well, so I actually have one more canon question for you. The Last American Virgin was the first canon movie. Yes. Is that right? And that was based on an Israeli sex comedy called L- L- Popsicle, Pops- Lemon Popsicle. Right. Have you seen that? Yes. Is that any good? No. <laughs> no. It's an Israeli sex comedy. Just take my word for it. It's not It's something you would want to sit through. You know, I mean, some of the gross-out comedies, I love the American Pie films. I think they're hilarious. Well, I love The Last American Virgin. I thought that was a great movie. Yeah, it was, and it made a lot of money, too. It did, okay. And, and that was at a period of time when their own competition was Crown International doing My my Tutor, My Chauffeur, all these movies where older women were seducing so teenage knock boys. Knockoffs with the Graduate or something? Knocked off with the Graduate in that one, Losing It, that Shelley Long did with Tom Cruise, where Tom loses his virginity in Tijuana. Whoa, I have not seen that. Yeah, that's an early one. But all those coming-of-age movies are all around the same time as Last American Virgin. The thing I liked about The Last American Virgin, I showed that to a friend of mine who hated the ending. And I was like, but that's so true to life, you know? Yeah. Like, it's... I don't want yeah, to spoil it, it for... No, no, but no, you're it. right. It is. But I was like, that. Just I think that's the first time because you see all these coming of but age... But you want to know one reason why I think all the movies, the edgy movies that came out of canon, it, my experience watching Menachem and Yoram produce these movies, you couldn't pin them down to come and look at your movie. I remember when they were doing House of the Long Shadows, Pete Walker was begging Menachem, you've got to come and look at the movie. Come and look at your movie. You just... Do you want to see five minutes? It's, oh, no, I, I'm sure it's fine. Go ahead. And then we come in, he'd look at, you know what, I'm on, I, I really have to go to this other meeting. No, just keep doing what you're doing. That's good. So I think a lot of things got greenlit and, and shot because he was too busy. And then the movies he directed himself. What? The Apple? You must see The Apple. I reckon it is the, <laughs> Mount, it is the Mount Everest of bad musicals. It's set in 1997. That's how far in the future it went. Oh, weird. And his idea of futuristic cars, it was like Chevrolets with fins. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And it's got, a, it's got actually a song that's a, an ode to crystal meth called Speed, which is <laughs> sung by my friend Catherine Scott, or no, Catherine Stewart. You know, she's in Night of the Comet. And okay, right. She's got a middle name, Catherine something Stewart. I can't remember. That's, that's a trip. I have not seen that movie. You but. have to see The Apple. See, I want to make that a midnight movie, but apparently the Egyptian showed it. Well, we'll see. Maybe maybe there will be a midnight. Maybe I can talk our friend that's been doing the midnight things at the Newark to do it. He showed Cruising there, and he showed uh, 
the Monster Squad. But, you know, I mean, there are just some movies that we've done to death. I don't want to see the Monster Squad anymore. I don't want to see Return of the Living Dead anymore. <laughs> Come on. I mean, how many, of those, how many of those tributes have I been involved with in the five years I've been back here? Yeah, I imagine. Why are they so I mean, popular? Well, I, the, the, I love both those movies. Yeah, but um, can you explain why we have to see them over and 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 over? Because you get newer audiences who haven't seen them. Right. They're, they're cult movies. You know, right. they're not just horror movies, so right. I understand the replay value. But yeah, you see something to death, you're, you don't want anything to do with it. That well, I feel that way sense. about The Beyond. The because beyond, I've no, seen right. The Beyond... More, I've seen the Beyond more than I should have seen the Beyond because of the of Fabio Fritzi and all the different music. Because I've seen it with live orchestra music with uh, synthesizer people. You know, the Egyptians showed the Beyond with a music uh, accompaniment. Ah, okay. And then I went to a concert of uh, where you guys went to the Fonda. I went there with Derek to see Goblin. Ah. They had two different groups: the original Simonelli with people, and then the other guy. I gotcha. So, and with it, they keep showing the movies over and over again. So I've seen the Beyond, and they just showed it again, again. They just showed it three or four days. Ago. Actually, I think isn't the cinematic void that's coming up? It's Waxwork, it's the Beyond, and one other. I think I know what you're talking about. Waxwork I see all those things on Facebook where it's like, yeah, here's a marathon of movies that are. Coming that you can see right here at home. Right. What what movie do you think you've seen more than anything, good or bad? Uh, well, I've seen the Fearless Vampire Killers at least oh, yeah, you, a you lot of times. But I've seen House of Wax lots and lots of times. I've seen the Horror of Dracula over and over and over and over again. I've seen. Uh, Non-horror movies like Lolita and The Magic Christian, I've seen lots and lots of times. Um, definitely Citizen Kane. Definitely uh, movie Sunset Boulevard. Definitely, yeah, a lot of classics I see over and over again. I've seen Lawrence of Arabia a number of times. But now movies like that, if I see them in the theater, I don't mind. Because it's, once again, we're talking about the comparison between music and movies. Right, you, know, you can see a movie as much as many times you would listen to music. Yeah, if it's good. David, well, we've been here for over two and a half hours. This has what? been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's flown by. Man. You mean I we could have seen me. Avengers Endgame? We'd still be thirty minutes to go. But before I let you go, there's a story you told me that I think is amazing, and I think the listeners would get a kick out of. Um, is your story with Anton Lavey? Well, Anton Lavey was the acknowledged. Uh, leader of the satanic church during after rosemary's baby and he was a technical consultant on the devil's reign but he had nothing to do with rosemary's baby and the thing you need to know about anton he was a carney barker he was a showman he was an entertainer his affiliation with the satanic church was a way to make money and and he enjoyed it and he liked pretty girls and he had a burlesque show with these women that were like uh, his satanic ladies with but here's the deal he wore an outfit with a cowl with red rubber horns and Kenneth Anger set up a meeting where he wrote uh, Anton a letter and said you must meet my friend David DelVal so I'm up in San Francisco and I have a meeting to go to Anton's home which is the black house in San Francisco, surrounded by barbed wire. The house had been full of bullet holes. People go by shooting. It was a, everyone, like this house was like cursed and it was painted black. And you went inside and it was all decorated like you would expect a Satanist to live. Black wallpaper, red wallpaper, infinity mirrors. So I'm in there and you know, I'm having wine with his wife, Diane, and we're all talking. And all of a sudden, up through the floor, comes Anton LaVey in his outfit with his rubber horns and everything. And I had like three glasses of wine, so I start laughing. Going, are you kidding me? Rubber horns? I mean, really? And he went, he lost his shit. <laughs> Get out of my house. How dare you make fun of me? Blah, 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 blah. So I was kicked out of his house, and about three days later, Kenneth Anger goes, what did you do to Anton LaVey? 
he's wrote him a letter and he said, how did you let this creep into my house? And I look back on it now and I, I just realized that my sense of humor is not everybody's sense of humor. But what I find odd about him as a, as a showman is why he didn't have more of a sense of humor about what he was doing. Because if ever there was an example of religion as entertainment, religion is show business. It's Anton LaVey's Church of Satan. Right. Were, were, were there a bunch of other people with you in no, there? Was I it was just fine you? with me. And I'll give you, I'll give you the Dracula. <laughs> pre, I'll give you the Dracula uh, 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 preamble to this. I'm in a taxi going toward his house. When the taxi realizes where he's taking me, he stops a block and a half before I can get to the desk. Get out of the cab. I'm not taking you there. It's just like you might. If I'd had luggage, you would have thrown it in the street. You know, like the coachman and Dracula. Yeah, I won't take yeah, you to wow. Borgo Pass. And so uh, before I even get there, there's this whole like building apprehension of going into this dark and, and spooky place. So when I saw him with those rubber horns and everything, <laughs> it took all the mysticism away. Right, yeah. See, I would have been more impressed with him if he had played down being a satanic personality. Right. But you know what I saw in his bathroom? I will never forget. Over the toilet were pictures of Anton in his getup initiating people into the satanic church. Guess who was in those pictures? Jane Mansfield, Sammy Davis Jr., Joey Bishop, a lot of the Rat Pack. I knew Sammy Davis Jr., or I'd heard a rumor that he was a Satanist, and I'm guessing... Well, I don't know that. I mean, first of all, if you're indoctrinated into that, you're not a Satanist. What you are is you're part of the, you know, the, the Beelzebub show, you know, I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm first of all, the fact he attracted Jane Mansfield. What does that tell you? This is a woman whose whole ambition in life was to be famous. So she and Anton have a lot in common. Right. But he was full of himself, you know, and uh, I think everyone, including Anton, benefited from Rosemary's Baby. But, you know, I mean, I, you know, I will apologize in the hereafter if I offended Mr. LeVay, but I just found it all much too funny. And you know what? It, it, to his credit, he, he, you know what his favorite movie was? Anton LaVey's... Car? No. His favorite movie was The Terror of Tiny Town, about a bunch of midgets that take over a Western village and reenact a Western. And it's the entire cast are midgets. Really? He loved midgets. I didn't know that. The reason I said the car was, and why I thought of this, was because that movie, I started watching last night, and it starts with a quote from Anton LaVey. Does it really? Yeah. And so I was like, oh. And then I was like, Well, you hey, know, man. the car is interesting. You know, as, as a memorabilia collector, and speaking of eBay, do you know that if you own photo, original photographs from the car, they're worth money? The car is one of the hardest t- pictures of the car from the movie, go for like $200. Jesus Christ. And I didn't know that. That and Mad Monster Party. Those are two movies that have cult status that if you can find posters and stills from them, they're all worth something. I just want to know that Barbara Streisand watched the car because she's married to the man who's the star of it. Is that James Bowen? Yes. She's, she's married? I yes. Saying, I didn't know that. Yeah, they're married. Wow, then yeah. So Barbara Streisand that. had to watch The Core. I had to watch the core. I like the car for the point where, I mean, I will give it some points for imagination. I love the fact when everyone is really aware it's a demonic presence, they all run into the pet cemetery. Yeah. Because it's hallowed ground. Now, that's interesting. Who thought that up? I mean, I I was watching that, and I think they were just... And the music's fun for it, too. I thought they ran in there because there's tombstones, and it was like the car... No, like, it's hallowed ground. That's... Okay. Because if, it's, if the devil is the car, then he would be... You're right, right, right. No, that's a good point. But, but it's certainly better than maximum overdrive. <laughs> but I don't think there's a famous person connected to the story of the car. There's no Stephen King or Clive. Barber. No, no, no. I don't, I don't even know who wrote it. Um, well, it's a, it's a cult movie of, and I did not realize till I started dealing and selling memorabilia from it that that's a big deal. It's a white whale. Of- the Four Skulls of Jonathan Drake is another one that where the stills are, you, it's a bidding war. It's just a weird 60s movie that you just, what? Or maybe it's a 50s movie. Maybe it's not even 60s. 
But uh, there's just so many horror movies. But I do love, the one thing I love about the way life is right now is all the movies, good, bad, or indifferent, whether we're talking Messiah of Evil, Lawrence of Arabia, The House That Jack Built, or Pet Cemetery, everything is available on on media that's either streaming or DVD or YouTube or I mean we didn't have this when I was a kid I mean if I wanted to see if I wanted to see fucking universal horror I had to wait till it turned up on TV and then you know make sure I was in the right area because then it might not you know I remember when we were when I was living up in Seattle I wanted to see Son of Dracula with Lon Chaney Jr. I was just a kid and we decided that weekend to go up into the mountains which had no antenna no 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 uh no juice i couldn't watch tv so i was just livid that i'd spend two days with no television and two days of no television when they're showing son of dracula that i'd never seen so i got up there and i had this thing called rabbit ears and i was pulling them like this and i finally got in front of the tv and i had i tried to watch this movie through the snow so that's how desperate i was to see a movie (laughs) and you look at nowadays where kids can just they can watch it. They can watch it on their phone. Right, yeah. That's I mean, that, it kind of takes the... See, part of the thing about being a monster kid in that period of time was you had to make an effort to see these movies. You had to really... It, it was it was, it was was sacrifice. Yeah, I see, I see what you're saying. It was a sacrifice to see it. And, and you would drop other things so you could watch that. And then that coupled with the monster magazines, all of a sudden I was reading letters, people living in other little towns that was watching the same stuff I was. But I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that we're all, I think the trivia has kind of connected us all because. Yeah. Because that's really where I met you for the first time, isn't it? Yeah. It was uh, Bill, our friend Bill brought me to play with your guys team, which I cannot pronounce the name. Um, So. Yeah, and then oh, the, what the team was called when Bill was there? Yeah, the Del Toro something. Oh, Hitchcock blender. Oh God, it was, that was we, we shouldn't leave. Bill. You don't leave Bill to figure out the name for anything. Thank you, Bill. But uh, yeah, well, now we're children of the porn, and I think before it's over, Peter, we got to have T-shirts. Yeah, I don't even fun. know what they will look like yet. <laughs> I have to find some really demented person to do it. Can it can be the. Uh, it's it, got to be filthy. Oh yeah, it'll be you know the cornfield that's like the silhouette without the kids, but it'll be a bunch of dicks. And- yes, yes, it's got to be phallic and nasty, and we got to wear them every time from that point on. But you know, I have to tell you, since trivia, the thing with T-shirts, I don't know about you, but I've got maybe twenty t-shirts with different horror things on every time i do a show i look for one i don't have you know i got the manito i've got salem's lot i've got a dracula i don't have a wolf man i've got a godzilla how many t-shirts have you got at this point from there i, I have that the because DVDs. you always wear a different one every time the, but those are just from my collection because i yeah well if i like a horror movie i'll try and track down a t-shirt if it's a little more obscure usually um I don't think I've got one any T-shirts. I've won random DVDs. But you got Pet Cemetery the other day. Yes, I did from the the screening. So I do have that. But and I have like some someone actually asked me before. He's like, "How many Pet Cemetery shirts do you have?" I have like three, not including that. But just. But there, you know, the thing about T-shirts, they're not always authorized. The, oh no, the no, best no, 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 ones no. are not. Yeah, right. Exactly. I have a Pet Cemetery two shirt that was legit, but that was not very popular. But it's kind of cool because it just says. Pet Cemetery too, and it just says raise some hell. So I was like, that's kind of funny. well. The two that I wish I still had, I had an original Death Records from the first original run of Phantom of the Paradise, but I wore it until it was gone. Right. And the other one, let's see, it was uh, Phantom of the Paradise, and the other one was uh, I had an original Salem's Lot that I got at Warner Brothers, but I wore that to death. That was just Reggie like that, which was part of the. Uh, poster art but i've seen all kinds of i mean all the poster art has reggie on it right most right. all of it the new salem's lot it's very different the rutger hour is interesting uh it's got the bus with the, the vampires that's missing from because the scene where the vampire kids are on the bus that's in the book is not in the reggie nalder version it's in the rob Lowe. was well, it's also in the sequel the return to Salem. Yeah, Lot. yeah. Where I wanted, you know, when Larry Cohen died the other day, I looked to see if I, I thought I had that movie. I had God told me to, 
I had uh, uh, the private file of J. Edgar Hoover that's rare, and I had the other Larry Cohen, Q. But I did not have Return to Salem's Lot, and I don't know that that Warner Brothers put that out as a regular Blu-ray. Do you have a VHS, like I, a, a VCR? Because I have that on VHS. I, can I don't have a VCR yeah. anymore. But didn't they put it on DVD? They did. It seems like they would have. I got this in the like the early 2000s. It's not a bad Before movie. DVD players were like the go-to, I guess. But I think it's interesting what Larry Cohen did with that. Because it then brings up using the cows, using livestock to get blood so you don't have to eat people. I don't even remember. It's been a... Like, it's been since probably 2002 or three since I've seen it. So I liked it. I liked it. It didn't have a Mr. Barlow in it, but it had Andrew Duggan in a monster makeup that didn't look too much. He ends it in a barn. I I just remember that because I've seen it recently. And then Larry, it's so weird that he just died because he was, we were right. He was a jump cut. He was a trivia. He was at the Egyptian. He he's been all over the place, right? Recently too. Same thing with Dick Miller dying. So right, after right. having just done a thing at Dark, and Dell was oh, there's another store you must if you're in the L.A. area. Dark Delicacies, which is moving over to Hollywood Way in Burbank, but it's the one and only horror boutique in Hollywood, uh, in Los Angeles, and it's well worth coming to if you're here. Yeah, and if you do check out Dark Delicacies, that whole strip has a lot of cool comic book stores. There's Halloween Town where Will blow your mind just because stores so like there's that. There's two Halloween. Yeah, so one with the costumes and one for the kids. Well, no, there's three because there's, there's a one that has the T-shirts and the props and all that. So it's like horror stores exist in Los Angeles, but I've never seen them anywhere else besides Fly By Night, like Halloween costumes. No, and anywhere. if you're in town on June first, there will be another Speakeasy pop up. Yeah, and I'm going to that one. You guys aren't gonna. That, Talk me out of it. That's what I was talking about at the beginning of the podcast. That's definitely worth checking out. Um, yeah. Where is I Like Scary Movies being? Where do you go to go through that? Is that in Hollywood? That was, I think, I want to say, that's kind of near Miracle Mile. Like well, it's, it's like down a, by LACMA. Sort of. It's Yeah, it's about a mile away from like the Grove. It's like in that vicinity. It's some like random building on the corner. Is it open now? Yeah, but you have to... Sign up. You have to, it costs money, but you have to schedule it because it's like tour. It's not a tour, but they let like twenty people in at a time or something along those lines. Okay. So you have to. How long does it take you to go through it? It took my wife and I about maybe a little over an hour. They're saying it takes and 90, you took ninety minutes. Of all of it. Yeah, yeah, most of it. Um, so some of the stuff. There's a couple of things that I was like, "Well, this is. I don't want to take a picture of this, but I don't want to spoil anything." Um, but it's, it's a fun experience. Like it was cool. It's, I, I, think should, you're I wonder how long it. it's going for. It's going, it runs through June. Oh, so okay. sometime in June. So All you don't right. have to jump on it like yeah, this, yeah. this minute. But, um, I'm and sure. then June 1st is the speakeasy again. Probably you think in the same location in Glendale. Yeah. I, that, that's my suspicion. But if you, if you go to www.ratedrspeakeasy.com and sign up for their RSVP, they'll, send you the address the day of and the first one was free this one's ten dollars but it's still worth it like I well and if you want to look i've just realized i have a website called sinisterimage.com if you type in sinisterimage.com it will take you to a number of sites uh that have material of mine either articles and i have a delval archives at something or other dot net remember my own stuff but sinisterimage.com will do it i think and david do you have social media that people can follow you on facebook you can follow me on facebook you can follow me on sinisterimage.com you can follow me through rapid heart tv i have two series one with charles band for haunted hollywood on his full moon label and i have ghoul please and <laughs> sinister image and Camp Grindhouse on Rapid Heart Entertainment, which is also online. And uh, if you're in Los Angeles this weekend, come to Monster Palooza in Pasadena, and I should be sitting with D. Wallace Saturday and Sunday. 
and we got to get you an Instagram page. I do. I you have Instagram. Instagram. I, I, I don't really. I, you don't I, use it yet. I, you I, haven't like gotten the bug. To, no, to I, I have to. Or there, there's also Twitter. I have a both. You know, I need to get on those because the day is going to come when Facebook is no more. Probably. Or people will. I mean, remember MySpace? And I oh, know, yeah. I, how long ago was that like happening? And there was, was even Friendster before that. Yeah, that social media was kind of had its evolution. And well, thank you so much, David, for. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad stories. I was your first that guest. It was a lot of fun. It's a long podcast. Hopefully, you guys got through it all because David has a lot to say. And I'd love to have you back sometime. Sure. No, we're going to hang format. out. We're going to be do trivia next week. And we got lots of stuff going on. But. You know, I hope you keep doing this because I think, you know, you're very committed to all of it. And you're a fun guy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's my goal to get as many, you know, people on here that I think are fascinating. And have, you know, if I think you're fascinating, I'm sure there's a lot of people. Who are I'm fascinated. So thank you, David. <laughs> thank you guys thank you, for, for listening. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is Dude with a Problem. <laughs> but uh, thank you guys. Take care.